everyone. Uh, as you can see, our executive director is still in the House Health Care Committee. We were asked to testify this morning. I was lucky to uh, go in and get my testimony done and escape quickly. Um, but Susan is still there. So there are a couple of things that she would normally announce in the executive director's report that would probably occur this afternoon, but there are a few things I wanted to uh, announce this morning. Um, number one, I think everyone's aware that uh, our general counsel, Judy Hinkin, left to take the position of deputy commissioner at Corrections, and we're pleased to announce this morning that um, Mike Barber is the new general counsel for the Mount Care Board. Um, we're very blessed to have uh, Mike's uh, intellect and knowledge. He did a incredibly great job running the all-pair model team for the last uh many months <laughs> almost a year and um we're just uh really thankful that mike has agreed to uh general council so welcome mike the other thing i wanted to announce is that on february 28th we have an addition to the agenda um, which will be a discussion on One Care Vermont 2018 budget order and grievance and approval summary. And so that will be added to uh, that agenda. Um, next week we have another uh, agenda that's packed and we'll start in the morning um, talking about um, stories being related back from the field as far as uh, the actual implementation of the all pair model. So that should be fascinating as well. And next Wednesday morning, we're also going to be joined, unless they get called away for other pressing issues, by both the Senate Health and Welfare Committee and the House um, Health Care Committee. So um, that should be a very interesting um, morning. So with that, the uh, first item on our agenda is the um, minutes of Wednesday, January 30th. Is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 30th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So those are approved. I abstain. I abstain. Oh, let the record note that there were two abstentions due to absence. So the vote was 3-0-2. Okay, so at this point in time, I'm going to invite uh, Pat Jones and her team down to uh, the front to start to um, walk us through a discussion on the 2020 hospital budget guidance. So good morning, Pat. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to have the opportunity to call on the team if we need me. I don't want to torture them by making them sit up here, but... Um, you could vote a friend at any time. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so what, what we want to try and do today is walk through the, um, the draft fiscal year 2020 hospital budget guidance. Um, we'll talk about the process for how this draft of the guidance was developed. I want to um, walk through a summary of the changes from the fiscal year 19 guidance, and that might be a little dry, but um, bear with me and um, feel free to ask questions. I want to talk about a proposal for April reporting from the hospitals. As you'll see, there's a couple of places where we are pulling um, information and reporting requirements out of the budget process, but it's information that we still want to receive. So we're recommending an April submission from the hospitals for those items. I'll walk through the draft appendices um, fairly quickly, talk about next steps. And then um, I have a couple of slides because we have received a request from Gifford Medical Center for a modification to their fiscal year 19 um, budget. So that's the, um, that's the lay of the land. So the process for developing um, the draft guidance, for about the past three months, the Green Mountain Care Board staff and two of our board members have been meeting um, about every other week with um, a work group. 
and we have um, appreciated membership and participation from the hospitals. We've had a cross-section of critical access hospitals and prospective payment system hospitals, including um, the Academic Medical Center. Uh, the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems has been there as well, and the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. And we have a couple folks in the room here um, who have been regular participants. Um, Julia Shaw, I see Chris Hickey just came in, uh, Mike Del Treco, Mark Stanislaus is here, and Jeff Team. And so I really want to thank them and the others who participate in this process. And I especially want to thank um, the wonderful members of our hospital budget team, Agatha Kessler, Kelly Thoreau, and, and Lori Perry for their incredible work as well. So we have um, heard, you know, input, technical advice, recommendations, and um, the result of that, um, as well as comments from individual members of the Green Mountain Care Board have resulted in the documents that you have before you today. So I will start um, walking through a summary of the changes from the fiscal year um, 19 guidance. First of all, there um, have been a couple of changes in terminology that are really clarifying. The first is that um, wherever we talk about net patient revenue, we now um, are saying net patient revenue and fixed prospective payments, which are those payments um, the all-inclusive population-based payments from the ACL. Um, so you'll see that acronym and that language throughout the document, just to be clear that whenever we talk about NPR, we really mean both. And then the other terminology we change we made is that um, we had referred to um, rate increases, um, meaning uh, increases or decreases to um, rates for, for uh, commercial payers as well as Medicare and Medicaid. Really the appropriate term is charge, and so you'll see throughout the document that we reference charge instead of rate. Just trying to get some precision there. Um, beyond the change in terminology, I want to note that um, in the introduction, that's a new section, the introduction, and it really outlines um, how the board will obtain information on quality improvement initiatives, on um, access to care and wait time information, um, community health needs, and participation in delivery system reform. Uh, board member Lodge recommended that introduction, and um, what it really does is outline that we are still very interested in all of those things, even though this is a budget um, process and the focus is primarily on financial um, requirements and reporting, um, those areas still remain high on the board's priority list when reviewing hospital performance. And then finally, um, there are a few new accounts and definitions. Um, we're just getting a little more granular um, on some of the assets, and so um, we've added, we will be adding accounts. I think we already have, haven't we added accounts to our um, web-based software that allow hospitals to report on restricted funded depreciation, unrestricted funded depreciation, restricted other board designated assets, and unrestricted other board designated assets. That helps us um, in terms of looking at um, metrics like days cash on hand and so forth. So just a note to particularly, most people won't care a whole lot about this, but for the hospitals, um, just a note that there are some new accounts. The next um, section in the guidance is um, the presentation requirements, and this literally refers to what the hospitals are asked to present at the budget hearings that we conduct in August. Um, so um, we've tried to standardize those presentations. Um, last year, um, 
we had quite a bit in there, and, um, and so the presentations were quite lengthy. We've tried to do some streamlining here, um, and I just want to note that um, just because these items, some of these items have been removed from the presentations, it doesn't mean that we aren't getting them in the narrative and that they aren't still um, important. So things that we've added to the presentation requirements, first of all, um, requests up front that the hospitals know what their MPR, fixed perspective payment, um, target rate of growth is um, for their fiscal year 20 budget and um, the changes in charges. The, the, we didn't overtly state that last year, so that wasn't always up front in the presentation, so we're asking for that. And then a second item that we are asking hospitals to add to their presentations this year is um, an assessment of the hospital's financial health. And we have a list of um, financial health indicators in Appendix 4, and we would like the hospitals to report on where they're at um, in terms of those indicators. And then finally, um, uh, in response to a comment from Board Member Pelham, we've just done a little definition on item number nine in the presentation requirements, the long-range financial outlook. We're defining that more specifically as a four to five-year outlook. So that's what's been added um, to those presentation requirements for August. What's been removed, and I want to know that you know, if it's been removed, it can still be highlighted by the hospital if it's considered to be an issue, a risk, or an opportunity. Um, we've removed the access wait time requirements. We've um, removed um, the hospital presenting on their response to the all-payer model quality measure results. And we've removed um, the requirement that they present information on their community health needs assessment update. But I will note that those are items that we're expecting the hospitals, if the board concurs, to report in April. And the staff will summarize that, and the board will have that information available for the budget hearings. Other things that we've removed from um, requiring hospitals to present are the in-state versus out-of-state payer mix. It's likely that hospitals for which that's a factor will highlight that as an issue, risk, or opportunity, but we're not going to require that every hospital speak to that. And then um, health reform progress and outcomes. While that was required in the presentations, and again, this could be something that comes up as an issue, risk, or opportunity, we're not going to require it in the presentations, but as you'll see in the narrative section of the guidance, there's, there are a number of questions related to healthcare reform. It's still very important to us. We just don't need to feel that we need to require it in the presentations. And I should note that when I say we, um, you know, this is the staff's recommendation to the board. Um, the, the first time the board has had a chance as a group to talk about this is today. So um, consider these recommendations. The, um, the next section, and probably the most robust section of the guidance, is the um, narrative requirements. And so you'll see that there are a number of, um, of changes here. Um, we've added a, a number of items. The first is that um, we are asking hospitals to explain, um, when, when they talk about their budget to budget changes, we're asking them to explain changes, not only uh, between their fiscal year 19 approved budget and their fiscal year 20 approved budget, but also changes over their full year fiscal year year 19 projections. That's a recommendation from board member Yusufer. Um, and it just clarifies that we're really looking to see that change over projections as well. Um, we're asking for hospitals to explain changes and um, projections in their operating margin and total margin as well. We um, are asking them to summarize investments in routine repairs and replacement 
Assessments Board member Lange um, noted last year that that's a um, new statutory um, requirement, so we've put that into the guidance. We are asking them um, to complete a table um, about their participation in lung care programs. That really is structuring data that we received last year. When we could, we tried to provide um, templates and sort of easier um, structuring of data for the, not only for the hospitals, but for staff and the board to more easily review. So there's a table for that now. Um, we, uh, board member Holmes um, asked for the following two questions, which is first of all, to indicate whether hospital employees are attributed to one care. Um, and that was a question that was asked last year during the hearings as well. And then also um, to have the hospitals describe how they're changing their allocation of resources to improve population health. So those are two new questions in the healthcare reform arena. Uh, board member Pelham um, requested a, a table on reporting the amount of um, bad debt. Um, and that is really sort of a look back, looking at fiscal year, end of fiscal year 17, and then what happened in fiscal year 18. And that table can be found in the appendices. Um, we also received a comment from HCA, the Office of Healthcare Advocate, asking um, that we more clearly state that the hospital should describe how um, changes and charges are calculated and what the impact of those is on gross revenue and net revenue by payer type. And there's a structured table in the um, appendices that uh, gets at some of that information as well. And then finally, um, Board Member Pelham asked um, that there be some information in there requiring hospitals to talk about how they address their cost shift in fiscal year 18. So those are additions to the narrative. Um, there were some things that were removed. Again, the community health needs assessment summary, the patient access and wait times, and the response to the all-payer model quality measure results. Um, we're proposing that those um, be removed, but that hospitals report on them um, using staff-provided templates in April. Uh, mental health treatment capacity information, um, that was considered to be a one-time ask last year, so that has been removed as a requirement for the narrative. Similarly, substance use disorder treatment capacity. However, I think we can assume that many hospitals will identify those two areas as um, areas of risk and challenge. Um, so we, it's, we do expect to hear some information about those two items. Um, healthcare reform investments, there was a spreadsheet that we had last year um, asking hospitals to outline um, their healthcare reform investments. That really came about before um, most of the hospitals were participating in the all-payer ACO model. We now have 12 of the 14 hospitals um, participating in that model. And as you'll see in a minute, we um, also are recommending that there not be um, a, an extra allowance for healthcare reform investments in the NPR growth target and that spreadsheet really supported um, that analysis. So. And then there was a table that was in um, last year's uh, guidance. It was a table 1B. It looked at NPR drivers by um, hospital department. And um, that was a challenge for hospitals to complete, first of all. And second of all, the Green Mountain Care Board staff can generate a similar table based on information provided by the hospitals. So we are recommending removal of that table.
Um, and then finally, um, under other requirements, um, there's sort of a, um, a you know, grouping of requirements that are not in the narrative section. You may recall that last year there was a table asking hospitals to report on salaries by category, by salary category. And, um, and that table is, um, it has stayed pretty much the same. We pulled out, there were some, some, there was some benefits information around um, health insurance and retirement, but we pulled that out because the information that we were getting from that was really an allocation and it wasn't um, accurate. And um, what we also did was add a couple of columns that calculate the percentages of staff and the percentages of salary that fall into each salary range. Um, but the inputs for the table are essentially the same. We are asking for more detail on organizational structure. This um, comes directly out of a recommendation from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. It's something that we believe the board um, would be interested in as well. We really want to, we've gotten organizational charts in the past, but um, we feel like we could get more information on w what the relationships are between hospitals and their related entities, whether it's a parent organization, a subsidiary. Um, we, we felt like there could be a bit more information. So you'll see more detail in that section. And then board member Pelham um, also recommended that we get information on financial risk um, that may be present in some of those relationships. So you'll see um, some additional detail in that section. And then really, um, the, you know, possibly the heart of the decision making is in the budget guidelines um, section. That's where we lay out the NPR, fixed perspective payment uh, growth target. And um, right now you'll see that there's not a value in there, but there are a couple of changes of note. The first is that we are recommending that um, the board set a two-year um, NPR, FPP growth target. One of the things we heard um, pretty clearly during our work group meetings is that the hospitals are really doing their budgeting in the, in the autumn for fiscal year 2020. And um, having some predictability around what the NPR <clears throat> target um, growth rate will be is, um, is important. And so, and we also, you know, have a, a, a five-year agreement with the federal government that takes us through 2022 that, outlines a total cost of care growth target. Those are two different things, one's per capita, one's you know, an in-state, the other's all revenue. But the, the idea of having some predictability really um, may seem to make a lot of sense. So we are recommending a two-year um, growth target. And then um, the other thing is that we are at this point, because most of the hospitals are um, participating um, squarely in health care reform. Well, all hospitals do some form of health care reform, but 12 of the 14 are participating in the all-payer model. We are recommending that there just be a single um, NPR growth target and that we not um, continue the health care reform investment allowance at this point in time. Um, I do want to say that um, Board member Lunge um, suggested that we have some language in here that, first of all, talks about our continued commitment and support of health care reform, but also um, that would allow the board to revisit the 2021 um, growth target if you opt to go with the two-year um, two growth target in the event that something um, significant changes in terms of hospital participation in the all-payer model. So you'll see that language in there. There's also some language about um, 
what, you know, we, we've had hospitals in recent years coming in below their approved budget. Um, you know, we, we are very focused right now on critical access, financial health, and really all hospitals' financial health. And so there's some language in there about um, hospitals that come in below budget. So um, if the way it reads is that if hospitals have either fiscal year 18 actual results and or fiscal year 19 projections that are at least 2% below budget, um, we would want to see their NPR growth limited <clears throat> to no more than 5% above their fiscal year 19 projections, unless there's some justification. We would want to see a clear explanation and some justification for growth that exceeded that. And the reason for that is that um, you know budgets that are set too high um, might not encourage um, the type of expense um, containment that you would hope to see in a situation where hospital revenues are down. So, um, so that's in the language as well. And then um, there's a statement, an overt statement, that the board will, in fact, look at changes in charges, um, including commercial charges. Uh, that's something the board has traditionally done. The board um, definitely did so last year, um, and we wanted to just be clear that that um, is an area that the board will look at. And then finally, there's some language um, that the work group really weighed in on about aligning um, our efforts with the movement to value-based purchasing and the all-payer model, and really outlining that the goals are to support um, participation in the all-payer model, to um, support financial sustainability of hospitals, and to support affordable health care for Vermonters. In the enforcement section, so um, each year around this time, we receive um, year-end actuals information. So right now, the staff is working tirelessly on the fiscal year 18 um, year-end results. And um, in the past, when the board looks at enforcement, um, the trigger has been hospitals that are 0.5% off um, of their budget. Uh, we got a lot of feedback that that's pretty rigorous. Like if a hospital's getting that close to their budget, they're, um, you know, they're doing pretty well. So we are recommending changing that um, sort of variance for looking at a hospital for enforcement purposes to 1% instead of the 0.5%. And then um, board member Lunge asks that we um, you know, put a statement in there saying that the Green Mountain Care Board, one of the actions that the board can take if um, a hospital is over, in this case it would really be over their budget, um, we can um, require hospitals to direct their funds for a specific use um, to address the budget issue. And an example of that is what you all did last year when um, the University of Vermont Medical Center was required to set aside funding for um, development of mental health and patient capacity. And then under provider acquisitions and transfers, not um, major changes here, but um, we're linking to the forms rather than including them in the, um, in the document because they are a work in progress. Um, the team is doing some nice work on consolidating forms and um, making them easier to, um, to complete. And then um, the statute was included in our guidance and we removed that because it's both cited and um, summarized virtually verbatim. So we didn't see the need to include the statutory language as well. So that, um, that is a quick tour of the changes um, in the guidance from the fiscal year 19 guidance. 
I do want to spend a moment before I walk through um, the appendices and talk about this proposal for April reporting. Um, we would, so um, we've been developing um, templates um, in three areas. Hospital um, reactions to all pair model quality measures, and in particular, um, any quality improvement initiatives that they're undertaking around those measures. Our staff provides them with um, the latest regional or health service area results for as many of the measures as we can get data for. And I want to be clear that it's not hospital results, um, it's health service area results. But um, we have, a, last year we obtained information from the hospitals on initiatives that they might have in some of those areas. And it was very helpful. So we'd like to continue to get that in April. Um, we also asked hospitals to report on access to care and specifically on wait times for various specialty services that they might provide, including primary care. And so we've developed um, a template for that as well um, and would like them to continue to report on, on wait times. And then finally, um, community health needs assessments. We had some fairly extensive um, information requests in last year's guidance, um, but we can access hospitals' community health needs assessments and their implementation plans um, easily on their websites. In addition, the Vermont Department of Health is doing some nice work on summarizing those. So what we're asking for um, from hospitals for, for community health needs assessments is to outline what their community needs are that were identified in that process when they're updating the report um, and information like that. So it's a streamlined um, information request, but we still want to get some information on the community health needs assessments. So the idea is that we would like to get, if, if the board concurs that this approach makes sense, we would like to get the um, templates out to the hospitals by the end of this month and then ask them to submit the completed templates by the end of April. Um, so that would be well in advance of budget submissions and budget hearings in August. And then the staff um, will summarize those submissions and provide them to you so that you have that really important contextual information in advance of the budget hearings in August so that you can um, you know, explore some of that further with the hospitals. It does a couple things. One, it gets you the information and provides context. Two, it allows the hospitals, when they're um, working on their July submissions, to really focus on the financial um, reporting um, that's required. So, um, so that's the proposal. I, um, you know, I'll put out there that if the board um, feels that it could bless that approach, um, we could get the, um, you know, the templates out to the hospitals right away. You have them in your packets. They're posted on our website. The work group um, certainly saw them. So I'll put that out there. I don't know if that's something you want to do this week or maybe wait till next week, but if we could get them out to the hospitals by um, the end of the month, that would be very helpful. Given the short timeline that the uh, month will be over um, and a week and a day, um, I think that it would be best if we tried to make a decision today. Is there anyone on the board that objects to the bifurcation of the data as proposed? Is there any member of the public that would like to make any comment or statement on the, these bifurcated dates? So seeing none, uh, would you need a formal motion, Pat? <laughs> Would a board member like to make a motion to uh, proceed with the proposal to uh, 
bifurcate the data and to have an equal reporting for the quality improvement initiatives, the uh, access to care and wait times, and the community health needs assessment? I'll move that uh, we approve the proposal for April reporting as described by our chair and Pat. Second. Is there discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So let the record know if that was a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And I want to especially thank Agatha for her work on um, those templates. She's done quite a nice job on that. So. Okay, quick walkthrough of the draft appendices. Um, and you know, then I think we can open it up for questions and discussions. Um, so there are 10 appendices um, in, the, um, in the document. Um, there is no change to Appendix 1, um, which talks about our um, budget modification um, process. So that's the same. Appendix 2 is the verification under oath um, form. There are two uh, things here. The first is that we, uh, we um, indicate that this oath should be completed by both the hospitals CEO and CFO, and then there is a placeholder. Um, the um, board chair Mullen, in particular, has um, indicated a desire to have the hospital's board chair complete an oath, and so we are in the process of um, developing some language for such an oath. So that's a, a placeholder um, right now in this document and that should be forthcoming fairly soon. Um, appendix 3, it has not changed. It's our exemption from uh, public hospital budget hearings. Um, I will note that our recommendation this year is that there be no exemptions from the budget hearings in fiscal year 2020. I think folks realize that um, given the current environment that we would probably want to hear from all hospitals. Appendix 4 um, is the list of financial health indicators that I um, had mentioned before. Um, there are indicators related to profitability, liquidity, capital structure, and cost. And um, Maury has um, put together some uh, benchmarks, too, that are associated with those financial health indicators. So those are there um, for the hospitals to reference when developing their presentation, and particularly the aspect of financial health. Appendix 5, um, I had mentioned previously, this is the structure table to obtain information from hospitals on their participation in health care reform and specifically on uh, their participation in the lung care program. Um, appendix 6 are uh, what we um, call the bridges tables. Um, they're the tables that show the budget to budget variance, really some of the drivers of that variance. I had mentioned before that we um, did remove table 1B from that, um, which had really a hospital department type look, and the staff will be able to provide a table that um, that, that offers similar information. Appendix 7 is um, a table um, trying to understand a little more about um, what's happening with bad debt. And again, this was a, a request from board member Pelham. So it looks at the total bad debt at the end of fiscal year 17, um, what, what additional bad debt is incurred during fiscal year 18, um, how much goes to collections during 18, how much was recovered from collections during 18, how much was written off during 18, and then what was the total bad debt at the end of fiscal year 18. So it's really um, a look back, but an effort for the board to obtain information on um, 
uh, what's happening in terms of that that that, that process. And just you know, for folks in the room who might not be aware, bad debt is considered um, uh, monies owed by patients who appear to have um, ability to pay. So. Appendix A is a, a structured table around the charge request. So it um, looks at the request to change in charges by um, different categories of service, so inpatient, outpatient, um, professional services, including primary care and specialty care, skilled nursing facility, if applicable. And if there's a, a row for other, if hospitals have other categories of service. Um, we're first looking for the requested change in charge, and then we ask for what's the overall change in charge, because hospitals um, increase or decrease charges by different amounts, um, sometimes based on the category of service. And then the remaining columns are really trying to get at what's the impact on the NPR. So that would bring in contractual allowances. So a hospital may ask, um, may request a certain charge, um, but they um, may not receive that. So this looks at um, what is the impact on NPR by payer type. And I think this gets at um, some of the questions that the Office of Healthcare Advocate had as well. Appendix nine is the revised salary table. Um, it's the total number of staff calculated the same way as last year, total salaries calculated the same way as last year, um, and then the remaining two columns look at the percent of total staff in each of the salary ranges and the percent of total salaries in each of the salary ranges. And then finally, Appendix 10 is a placeholder um, for questions um, from the Office of Healthcare Advocate. You may recall that we um, provided those um, with the guidance last year, and that was helpful, um, I think, for the hospitals and for the HCA. And so we are planning to do so again and have requested those questions from the HCA. So that, um, What's the timeline for that? Um, I, may I phone a friend in the audience? Sure. <laughs> Julian? <laughs> Julia, I'll ask about that. So we plan to spend the most amount of time on that is in the board, because some of our questions are uh, there not being included in the guidance. Um, but the thing is, Thank you. So at this point, um, I'll you know, open it up for discussion. Um, in terms of next steps, um, we're looking at a public comment period. Um, if any revisions are needed to the guidance, those can be made. We do want to add that oath and the HCA questions to the appendices. Um, we need a board vote on a final draft no later than March 31st. That's the, um, I think it's a statutory deadline to get the guidance out. So. What type of uh, length of public comment period are you, are you suggesting? Um, the, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate requested a 10 day, um, you know, I think somewhere in a, I mean, a week to two week range makes sense. So. And that's I still. We typically we do a couple weeks, so probably should go with the full 14 mm -hmm. days. Yeah, so that, I mean, I think that still gives plenty of time for finalizing the guidance before the March 31st deadline. Um, and uh, that's it, because you already provide us support for the proposed April reporting. So I'll stop there. And... So questions for Pat and the board. Jess. My only comment, and, and Pat, you and I have talked a little bit about this, and we've gone back and forth a little bit, and I, I'm really more interested in hearing as well from some of the board members on this topic, which is, first of all, a big, huge thank you, because I do think that there's so many improvements in this budget guidance, and I know so many stakeholders were involved, and I'm, I'm really thrilled about some of the movements going forward. Um, 
But one of the things that I just wanted to bring up was we've integrated the all-payer model quality metrics into our process, you know, moving it into April, but it's still part of our process of oversight of hospitals. And something that I've been grappling with and we've been thinking about trying to figure out how to do this is how to integrate the all-payer model financial metrics into our process, whether that be this year or in following years, is something I think we need to think about, these, these total cost of care growth rates. Uh, per capita. So one thought I just had, and I'm just going to throw this out there, was in much the same way that last year we put together that table of the all-payer model quality metrics for each HSA and simply asked the, the hospitals to respond to it, with, you know, uh, their response to what they see happening in their hospital service area. Another thing that potentially we could add is doing the same thing with total cost of care growth rates for the population in their HSA and then by payer, and simply asking the hospitals to respond again to that data. It starts to move us aligning our budget process with some of the metrics that we're gonna be held accountable for with the all-payer model. So I don't know if, Pat, you wanna talk about that or just the board members have any response, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. Yeah, I would just add, I think um, that would be a good add and whether we could put an appendix you know, table in to capture that is something that they also could be reported on. I think we have the data. I mean, we can cap, we can, the board has access to the actual data. It'd be more like putting a table together, much the same way we do with the all-payer model quality metrics and just asking for response. Mm -hmm. What do they see happening in the cost of care growth rates in their hospital service area? Recognizing that it's probably gonna be a resident level analysis and some of those uh, individuals living in that hospital service area may not be seeking the care at the local hospitals. I mean, there's a lot of caveats to that data analysis, but just a starting point. I think it would be really interesting to uh, have the dialogue with the responses because basically um, we hear anecdotally a lot of why there are variations, whether it's um, demographics um, for age, um, health factors like smoking, obesity, things like that. We also um, have heard anecdotally from individual hospitals that blame um, a higher than average total cost of care on the um, business that leaves their hospital to go to um, a tertiary hospital and that impacts their numbers. So it would be interesting to, to see what the different, each individual hospital does believe. So. I think it would be useful. Um, hopefully it won't be too much work. That's the other consideration. Yeah, I was gonna ask if we had, if someone had talked with the data team, since presumably they would be producing it, and just to make sure that time-wise and staffing-wise, they don't have, I mean, they have a lot of reporting coming up with the feds, so I just didn't know capacity-wise what our capacity is. I love the idea, I think it's a great idea, so that would be my own. Yeah, I think we need to get the feedback from our staff, but we also need to get feedback from hospitals on yep. how much work it would be for them. So, one thing that I, I will say, Pat, is um, I think this process that you've uh, gone through coming forward with the guidance has been exemplary. And it's a true uh, work of collaboration where you work side by side with the entities that are regulated by us. and. Um, worked in a way that to come up with better guidance um, that understands what the realities are for the regulated entities as well as for us trying to make decisions. And, um, it just reminds me of how sad I'm gonna be when you walk out the door. <laughs> but. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just know that um, you know, the participation of both the HCA and the hospitals was really um, incredibly helpful. And I'll again um, note the um, phenomenal team that we have here um, that works day to day on the, on the hospital budget process. And um, you know, to speak to Board Member Holmes's um, recommendation, I think um, you know uh, this the uh, key point that you made is that. The data that we get, because we don't um, at this point have ACO attribution um, for a good chunk of um, the um, people who are in our all-payer claims database, just the same way that we do with the quality of 
information, just being really clear that these aren't um, hospital results. Um, these are these are um, geographic um, area results that you can't be considered to be that hospital's total cost of care, um, but they're um, regional. Um, it's regional data that um, they could react to accordingly. And I'm sure the data team would have some other caveats too. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment, which is uh, I also think there's been some great improvements um, in the hospital guidance this year. I like the idea of a, a two year NPR myself. I think it does provide stability and aligns well with kind of continuing to get everybody rowing in the same direction of the all care model. Um, and I think it makes sense to spread out the reporting so that it's a little bit uh, easier on the hospitals and our staff in terms of collecting the quality data. Uh, I think Pat made a did an excellent job summarizing the concerns that I raised with her initially around that, which are basically that when we're approaching the financial components, it has to be in a context of the triple aim and the goals of the all care model, which are not just financial. Uh, having uh, the financial results alone without understanding the quality and the access issues to me are, like I just don't think that way. So especially given the way that uh, we as a state are trying to approach healthcare reform. So I guess I just wanted to emphasize that while I, I think the submissions will be very financially uh, focused, I for one will still be asking questions about the other stuff, including participation in healthcare reform. We get a good view from the ACO and the ACO budget process about how they think things are going in terms of operational changes on the ground, but I found it very interesting and informative to have the hospitals share with us how they're approaching their own operational changes. Because the reality is, if we don't have everyone in the community rowing in the same direction and making changes in the, at the community level, the all care model is not gonna be successful. So I just wanted to say that out loud so that there's an expectation and an understanding of at least how I'm gonna approach questions over the summer. Thank you very much, Robin. And I want to follow up on your comments to say that I think this might be the time to probably start a conversation that may take weeks to uh, resolve. But I just want to say that um, I think that the clarity and the certainty that a two-year process would provide to the hospitals is going to be very welcome at this time. And in addition to the financial struggles that rural hospitals are, are facing throughout whole country and apparently throughout the whole world because there was a piece that Pat pointed out about Russia <laughs> just yesterday or the day before um, but with that uh, backdrop and the fact that uh, these are critical years for our, our ability to achieve success to meet the financial targets that are in the all pair model um, I would just throw out for an initial discussion for us to consider over the next few weeks that, it, at least in my mind, I think it would make sense to have two years at the 3.5% um, level that mirrors what the financial target is in the all-payer model. So that's just to start the discussion rolling and the board members can comment as they like.
hospitals to be thinking about really some critical changes that they're going to have to be thinking about in terms of moving from fee-for-service to value-based <coughs> incentives. Um, I would just add, I think one of the factors that we're going to need to look at when we come up with this rate is some of the historical and where we've been historically. Um, 3.5 would be a bit higher than where we have been in the past couple of years. Um, so this leads to consideration as we look at it. I know it does tie into the total cost of care targets, but it's something we should consider as well. And I appreciate that. Uh, actually, uh, to expand on why I'm thinking that we need to be higher than where we were at in the last two years is that um, as I have been traveling with Pat and meeting with different hospitals around the state to uh, just check in on financial solvency, one of the things that has become increasingly clear is that the supply demand equation for wages that uh, the hospitals are facing is going to be severe over the next few years. And when you look at the demand uh, for higher salaries, the, the lack of a supply of sufficient healthcare workers, whether it be nurses, doctors, techs, what have you, um, unfortunately, there may be a little bit of an arms race until there's actually a catch up by higher ed to be able to create more graduates and give them fields. And I don't, I don't think that the next few years are going to be easy for anyone sitting on a hospital board, anyone sitting as a CEO or a CFO, and there's going to be some hard decisions that are going to have to be made just to deal with wages alone. I'll just jump in here. Um, I think that I hear what I'm, you know, I'll, I agree with much of what I've been hearing. Um, I like the two-year predictability. I think that I was in some of those meetings where I heard some of the hospitals talking about how they do their budgets way in advance and having some year, two years, some idea two years out of what they can expect from the board is really helpful in their planning. So I, I really like that idea. Um, and to your point, Kevin, I do think that the, the wage pressures that we're seeing in our state and nationally are really important to think about. The workforce shortages that we have, the access to care issues that we see happening in our state um, are going to be putting pressures on some of these hospitals, and we have to uh, recognize that. The other issue I think we have to think about is we're seeing rural hospitals struggling all over the country, and we're asking our rural hospitals, who are already struggling for many of the same reasons that other uh, hospitals are struggling, we're also asking them to change their delivery system. And so I think to the extent that we can give them some headroom to be able to really change how they do their business and um, shifting resources away from the speaker service model towards this uh, value-based model, I think is going to be important. And they're going to be having to change their personnel and change their delivery system and what they deliver to achieve population health goals. So. I'm more comfortable perhaps than I would have been in the past with the growth rates at about 3.5. Um, I think that's a good starting place for the conversation. Um, like Jess, I, 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 I think the two-year window is a good thing. I think it, it's uh, long enough to give hospitals to kind of do some more long-term planning as to where they are and what they want to be. Uh, but it's short enough to uh, you know that we have a recurring window and be able to address any issues. Um, I I, I, wor I can't say I worry, but I wonder if, for example, we had a three and a half percent you know uh, growth rate, um, that some hospitals uh, could use all of that easily given their payer mix um, and, and and grow to that amount, and other hospitals just don't have the capacity given their payer mix. And so, you know, I've spent some time looking at the state budget, you know, the proposed budget. And if you look at just the portion uh, in DIVA for, uh, to support uh, medical efforts, it's uh, less than a few tenths of a percent growth rate. And so if you are, uh, and I, I, I don't, there is a relationship here, I don't know how direct it is, but if you are in a uh, <coughs> service area, you know, like Springfield or Brattleboro, um, you can have three and a half percent. It doesn't do you any good because you, you don't have the 
in your, the, the base in, in, in your uh, in who you're serving to uh, to uh, make up for a Medicaid cost shift off other payers. So I, I think we need to think that through. But it, isn't that there's language in there that looks at what the actuals are, right? And so to the extent that the actuals are well below what that what was projected, um, the three and a half wouldn't necessarily apply, right? And there's language in there that suggests that we need that each hospital needs to be looking at what their projected uh, year-end actuals are. Yeah, I, I don't so, ever want any hospital to think that um, this is a guaranteed three and a half percent increase on NPSR because somebody could ask for a 22 percent charge increase to try to meet that and that's certainly would not be approved by this board right no so, my, my point is I think there is a burden on us to be sensitive to that uh, to that issue that um, if a uh, if a hospital has a payer mix uh, that uh, where their major payer is flatlining them they, they, they can't even get to three and a half percent and um, uh, and uh, and I don't think we have a solution yet for that, um, but it's something I think that we need to be aware of um, you know, as, as we uh, you know establish a three and a half percent goal, and you know Chippewa County can, can service that, but uh, you know um, Springfield can't. Um, and, um, you, even uh, you know it's just wishful thinking to think that they can. And so you could have two hospitals hypothetically with the exact same cost structure and one can support that cost structure and one can't support that cost structure. That's true. And I think that there has to be a loud message sent that we're not going to accept aspirational budgets. That, that, that has to stop. I think, and one other thing we're going to have to consider in the guidance when we talk about a two-year is if, if a hospital either exceeds or misses in the first year. So if you start with 100, and as your, as your actual, when you come in at 105 in the first year, then the expectation is you're gonna end up you know, around 107 or so in the second year, and or could be, and that's something we'll have to discuss, vice versa, if you came in, you went 100 and you came in at 102 the first year, or we allow it 107 the next year. So I think it, you know, putting out a two-year target, and people are, are looking to that, um, you know, we're going to have to give some guidance on some of the expectations because we know, a, a, you know, budget is is not where they actually come out, and so everyone is always different, and they're either below or above. And so, if you're dealing with a two-year, I think it helps with the predictability. But I, I also think there needs to be an understanding of if you exceed in that first year, you don't shouldn't expect to get three and a half percent the next year, and if you miss. There may be a reason why, and to, I think Tom's point of how would you get there, maybe you still could go there. But those are some of the things we'll have to consider as we frame it. But just to clarify, we're not putting out a two-year budget target. What we're putting out is um, what the guidance would be for the NPSR for each one of those years over a two-year period to provide that certainty. But it's not a, a compounded growth of 3.5 between year one and year three. So I, I just want to make that point perfectly clear as well. Other comments from the board? I just also wanted to say I really like the addition of the appendix trying to get clarity on the charges, uh, the changes in charges and how that impacts NPR and also how then the pair mix feeds into all that because I think that that is in order for us to do our job trying to tie together our regulatory processes back to the rate review process or we will have done the rate review process so forward from the rate review process I think it's it's hard to do that since we're comparing apples and oranges so uh, I think that piece of it may be very helpful in terms of trying to continue our our efforts to track the dollars through each of the regulatory processes. So I just wanted to say thanks. I think that was some good thinking on, on that part. Actually, on that note, on good thinking, I would also say the enforcement increasing the variance from 0.5 to 1%, I think that's a good idea. I and mean, I think hitting your budget within 0.5% is pretty impressive in this world of changing <laughs> healthcare landscape. So I think a 1% margin is probably more appropriate. So I appreciated that. 
Yeah, there was just one other thing I wanted to clarify is we talked about um, the condition where the hospital fell below in a year that they could potentially go up, you know, five percent the next year. You know, that really was trying to look at. We have several hospitals who have come in with budgets that were significantly higher year over year to their where their actuals were trending, but were within the budget guidance. So we wanted to make sure that we were looking at that. You know, on the flip side, if a hospital is coming in higher, um, you know, we're looking at containing costs and containing NPR. So we would we did not put that in on the flip side to say if you're coming in higher, then you can also expect to go off that higher amount. So that's why that's not in the guidance because I know some of the hospitals were potentially looking to include the other side of that and it, it really wasn't for that purpose. The purpose was to protect ourselves for those hospitals who are underperforming to make sure we don't have aspirational budgets that could then come to situations where they're losing a lot of money at the bottom line because they're not managing expenses to where their top line is really trending. Other comments? Uh, I just like to say, um, in high school, my English teacher used to say, "Less is more. Less is more." You know, when you're trying to write something, and so I could tell that you've done a great job, along with Marine's help and the staff, because I know that if I put this year's guidance on the scale versus uh, prior year guidance on the scale, yours would weigh less, and therefore you you've been more concise to, <laughs> to the point. Thank you. Good job. Before we talk about Gifford, is it okay to open it up to the public for comments on the uh, guidance as presented? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we'll open it up to the public for comments on the uh, guidance as presented. Julia. Yeah, Julia Shaw, again, healthcare advocate. I'm just looking for some, a little bit of additional detail on um, what you do envision for the two year growth rate. So I, I was a little confused by what a few different board members said. So. If it was 3.5 and then 3.5, um, can you just explain how you envision that? It would it be, is it seven off of the current budget or is no. it 3.5 and then? So if the, the following year we compound another 3.5% off of what they were working from. So um, it's not, at least in my mind, it's not a two year percentage, it's setting the percentage for each of the two years. So it would be 3.5 this coming budget year and 3.5 the following budget year. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay. But I think um, we have to look at how that plays out because if a hospital has a budget of 100, they come in at 3.5 in the first year and then we're working off the budget for, that's what we work on budget to budget, and they come in at 3.5 the next year, even if they're falling short that year, you know, that would be a compound. So I think we need to look at how it's going to be executed and be cautious of how hospitals come in on the first year because if we approve them at a 3.5 and we're going budget to budget, then they would be able to come in with a 3.5 the next year even if they fell short. So it's, it's going to be dependent on if a budget, if someone comes in at one and a half, then the next year would be three and a half off that. Okay, other comments from the public? Yes. Mark. Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network. And, you know, just from our Vermont hospitals, we would like to throw out a sincere thank you to the Green Mountain Care Board and their staff, um, DIVA, the HCA, and our fellow colleagues across the Vermont hospitals, and also the board for allowing us to participate in these conversations. I think they were productive conversations. I think we tried to find, you know, you know, shared solutions, sometimes from different perspectives. So I would just like to call out that thank you to everybody, because at least from my perspective as participating in them, um, I certainly saw that throughout the process. Um, there is one item that we would like to have a better understanding from the board on. This is a great opportunity on how we align, you know, two different processes that haven't really been aligned very, very well. And that's the historical, budget review process and the all-payer model in the Green Mountain or um, uh, 
and you know the ACL, which is transitioning to a per patient payment model. And in part of our feedback, we'd hope there would be some recognition that if patients were changing around the state or moving to different counties, and that was the basis within that HSA, that that population that was based and was attributed to those hospitals participating or hospital participating in the care of those patients, acknowledging that we do only have one tertiary care hospital in the state of Vermont, which would be directly impacted by this. Also, that this would be an opportunity for at least to open up the conversation a little bit more in the guidance to say if that was happening to allow the hospitals to come to the board and to engage in the conversation on how that might affect their revenue base. So there is some interest to get the board's perspective on that thought. Um, yeah, I can. I mean, it's it's an area of pretty great complexity, needless to say, looking at aligning um, the financial metrics that are in the all-payer model, which is a per capita total cost of care for Vermont residents with what we've historically looked at over time uh, in terms of NPR, regardless of whether patients are in state or out of state, not on a per capita, but rather on a total um, total basis. And, you know, we've had some preliminary conversations around that. Um, you know, I think what Mark is suggesting is that if um, we do see some movement, whether it's in terms of attribution, um, people who haven't gotten care starting to get care. Um, you know, I think the request is that there be an ability to look at that during the budget process. I think I think that can happen without overt language. Um, I think, you know, the board should consider whether it wants to put a more definitive statement in the guidance um, as to whether that is something that, that you will look at. But I don't think there's anything that precludes a hospital from coming and making its case. And I would think you would want to see if there is movement of patients or greater attribution that um, that be brought out in the budget hearing process and in the submissions. Yeah, I just want to comment as well that I think um, one of the challenges there is, you know, first of all, we're to, we kind of put out an NPR rate that's the same for all hospitals, so that kind of starts the challenge. But I think if the UVM network, since they're so large, if they were getting, you know, more patients coming there and needed a higher NPR, the challenge would be that where does it come out of which hospital? And so, you know, that we need to see some offset somewhere. And, you know, if you guys move up, I'll make a big number, half a percent, that could be, you know, two percent reduction at, at another hospital if it's shifting. So I, I think that's kind of the cha one of the challenges would be where are they coming from and how do we make that offset somewhere else if we were to do what I think you're saying, which, which is maybe you're going to trend higher. I think all I'm saying is to allow some work in the guidance to allow us to engage in that conversation. We know where the challenges are. We know they don't perfectly line up. But to at least allow the opportunity to have that conversation. So you will be allowed to have that conversation, whether it's in the guidance or not. Yeah, I mean, to me, that sounds like a risk slash opportunity related to healthcare reform, which I think we do want to hear about. Um, you know, I, I think part of the reason why we had actually included the in-state, out-of-state last year, which is a different issue, but it was in response to some of the movement of care that we were seeing. So just by analogy, I think even without having the language in there, to the extent that it's a risk or an opportunity for the hospital, uh, and related to healthcare reform, I at least would definitely welcome the conversation. Okay, yes, Chris. 
Yeah, just first of all, I want to reiterate what Mark said about um, you know the the openness of the conversation we had. I think it was very good. And Pat, you know, I commend you and your team for all the work that you did on that. That was great. Um, that's number one. Number two, I want to re respond to um, the conversation about the two year, and Maureen specifically your comment about if we're one and a half one year, then there wouldn't be an expectation that you could go more than three and a half in the next. I think the conversation we had about setting a multi-year target was to uh, not penalize hospitals for uh, the potential of maybe an orthopedic surgeon that generates this, a significant component of, of revenue for uh, you know a hospital is not there one year. So instead of you only end up with a, a percent and a half. Um, that the next year when that orthopedic surgeon is operating under full uh, capacity, that maybe that next year has to be four and a half or five or whatever the number might happen to be. So I think that multi-year gave the flexibility of sitting back and saying either one way or the other, you could be four in one year and three in the next, or you could be two and a half and three and a half or whatever the math works out to, but it would allow that flexibility based on maybe something that happens within your uh, particular practice um, or your particular organization as it relates to uh, uh, you know, uh, the physician complement. Um, the third comment I'll make is in relationship to Mark's point. Um, I think part of that is happening through the transfer opportunities you've given, at least for our organization, because you know, we keep pushing to say care should be provided locally, no offense to UVM, they, they do what they need to do. Um, but I mean, we continue to, to provide services to our community that we think should be provided in our community. And sometimes that is a transfer uh, from the network into the smaller community hospitals. We just added neurology as an example. And we're contracting with UVM to provide the neurologists. But again, it's a transfer of that service from one service area to another service area. But, and I think that's, probably going to continue to happen uh, for those services that should occur within uh, you know individual communities so I think there is an opportunity through transfer to do that but I think there also has to be an opportunity through dialogue to understand that movement of patients whether it be because of attributed lives or whether it's because of access to specialists I mean most of what's happened in our organization has been access to specialists over the last uh, three years or so three comments. Any other comments? So I don't see any Pat, so maybe we should move on towards paper. So um, this is really uh, just teeing up a discussion, but uh, I think you're all aware that we have received a request. Um, it came in last week from the Gifford Medical Center, and the request was for a fiscal year 19 budget modification. They're asking for a 1.25% increase in the hospital's average charge, and um, they're asking for an effective date of March 14th on that. If, it, if, if the board were to grant that request and it were to take effect then, they're estimating that the fiscal year 19 impact on NPR and FPP would be about $300,000, and the annualized uh, increase would be estimated about 565,000. Um, are we convinced, have we, do we have the information that would tell us that um, insurers would honor a request on a mid-month date for example, March 14th. And we we do not have information about whether the insurers would um, would concur with that or not. And I, I, I don't. It may be set up that um, it's a percent of charge um, situation, but I'm not um, I'm not aware of that. Uh, the, one of the requirements that we have is that the hospital's board authorize a request, Gifford's board did so at its January 24th meeting. And I'll just note that in the letter um, that was received requesting the modification, 
Gifford cited workforce pressures, um, in particular um, employee um, survey feedback indicating that um, they didn't feel their wages were at market um, levels. Um, they have not been able to provide an increase. And then they also spoke to their um, financial health. Gifford has had some negative operating margins in recent years. They um, have reduced costs. Um, but they said that despite those cost containment efforts, um, they're still looking at negative operating margins. They also cited the hospital's age of plan, which is above um, the average, and um, the need to have some capital available for um, addressing that, as opposed to filling in the gaps in uh, negative margins. Uh, I'll just um, quickly show this slide. Um, last year, um, for their fiscal year 19 budget, they came in with an NPR growth rate of minus 6.1% um, from their 18 budget. Uh, the board um, did not change um, that, so approved that negative growth rate. The total NPR was just shy of 56 million. It's the commercial rate increase that was uh, that was changed. Gifford came in asking for a 4% commercial rate increase. The board reduced that to 2.75. So a couple of things at least that I would be looking for as we're doing the analysis. Um, number one, um, consistent with the movement that we've seen in the uh, proposed guidance for next year, because Gifford is a one of three in the country, along with Springfield, that um, is a hospital owned by an FQHC. I'd like to see the financial information for the affiliated companies and how that impacts on uh, Gifford. And um, also, I, I think uh, it would be helpful to have a corrective action plan, given that, um, again, um, this is a case where NPSR is not growing and that it really needs to be a plan that addresses expenses relative to the reality of the revenues. And um, I would hope that um, we could ask for them to present us with a corrective action plan as we're looking at this. So. Uh, yeah, I would just add a couple things as well. Um, one would be, I think if we put on, this this was another one where if we looked at their actuals for 18 to where their projected 19 was coming in, um, I believe it was an increase. It was just they fell so far short against their budget. Um, whether or not they could provide us with a now an updated forecast uh, full year for the P&L. And, you know, I think for context to look at what their historical commercial rate increases have been, and what their um, budget to operating loss was for 18, because they came in quite quite short when we look at their 18 budget to their 18 actual. So I think at least showing the board their 18 budget to their 18 actual, I'm not sure whether they'll be able to give us a 19 kind of reforecast, assuming they get this increase, um, because this. I'm not even sure it's going to put much of a dent into where they came out. And I think their loss um, in 18 was pretty significant, um, and 19 may be trending there, you know, as well. So not to say I don't support this. I just think it's it's not even going to really solve their problems. And to Kevin's point, really having a corrective action plan to how are they going to line up their expenses with their revenue base. Um, you know, assuming they get this. Um, yeah, I will note that um, it looks like, and um, I'm going to look to Kelly here, but it looks like um, they had they are uh, they experienced a net, both a negative operating margin and total margin in um, fiscal year 18. Is that accurate, Kelly? Um, and they and they were down quite significantly. Um, in their NPR budget um, to action. 
questions or comments from the board? So I, I'm just trying to wonder how this works. Um, in that I, I don't, in terms of kind of Medicare rates and um, Medicaid rates, um, I can't see them changing on March 14th, even if we approve this. So um, I'm just wondering what, what the relationship here is to the pay of different payers and whether or not a giver has any sense that the commercial payers or the self-insured payers are, um, you know, that, that this is a, a, a viable path to follow. So it's my understanding that they've researched their contracts with the commercial payers and their contracts allow for uh, up to a certain percentage of this falls within it and they are confident that um, they will have higher reimbursement on the commercial side, but you're correct on the other payers. Okay, so I, I mean, I didn't know that. So, so uh, we've been informed that their contractual arrangements uh, uh, allow this additional margin. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, Tom. Tom's that, question was, have we been informed that their existing contracts allow for an increase? And I believe we have been, but I'll leave it up to you. Okay, we'll, we'll verify that. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Any comments from the public? Seeing none. Um, Pat, did you have anything else you want, want to discuss this morning, or? No, um, I, I, I will just take a moment to thank all of you. Um, I'm not sure everyone in the room um, is aware that I will be um, departing. Um, and am taking a, a, a new position um, for me at, um, at DIVA. But I, I did want to thank all of you for the um, incredible opportunity that you've given me over, I guess, about the last five or six years. It's been um, a real pleasure. It's been an incredible learning experience. And um, I can't say enough as well about the staff. Um, that I've had the opportunity to work with. So just thank you. So actually, we should be thanking you because it, we all benefited from having had the opportunity to work with you and to see your work ethic, to see your collaborative abilities, to, to see the way people want to work with you, um, to see the smile on the face both at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Um, is something that um, we treasure and you will be missed greatly. Thank you. With that, we'll, we are going to recess till 1 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you very much. So welcome everyone. We're going to get uh, started and resume the meeting from this morning. And uh, the next item on the agenda is the Qualified Health Plan um, Standard Plan Design. And we welcome um, Diva and Wakely this afternoon. And whenever you're ready, take it away. Great. So um, I'm just going to test the volume of this mic that seems very strong. Yeah. Can everyone hear me okay? We can. Better? Yeah. Can everybody okay. back there? <clears throat> Wonderful. Um, so my name is Addie Strumlo. I'm the healthcare director at the Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, I'm just going to say a few words and then quickly turn it over to Dana to run through our presentation today. Um, so we are here obviously representing the department at this milestone in our annual Qualified Health Plan certification process. Um, specifically, we will present the plan design proposals for the standard QHBs for your review and approval. Um, Dana will spend time talking through kind of how we got here, but I just wanted to mentioned that we are very happy to be here. We had um, quite a last few months waiting for the critical federal guidance that drives our development of the plan design. Um, and that was just issued several weeks ago. So the fact that we're even here before you in February is a testament to a lot of hard work by the team and our partners at Weekly and others. So wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so I just wanted to flag a few items to kind of guide your review today. Uh, it's a relatively routine year in terms of the plan design, but there are several factors that are influencing the proposal. Um, the first, as always, and as mentioned, is the federal guidance, so specifically 
the actuarial value calculator that the federal government issues um, and that enables us to design compliant plans within federal parameters. Um, the second is the concept of silver loading, which you'll remember from last year. This is our second year coming to you with the reflective plans, which are in place to hold um, those customers who are not eligible for subsidies, harmless from inflated premiums. Um, and Dana can walk through this again, but that's the premium is inflated to account for the loss of funding for the federal cost sharing reduction program. And then the third is state legislation. So um, Act 7 in particular, which was passed uh, very late last session or in the special session, um, mandate certain chiropractic and PT uh, co-payments. So you'll see that throughout the presentation today as another uh, factor in the plan design. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention, I know it's very helpful for your review to see the uh, enrollment data in terms of how many Vermonters are in each of these plans. We have to work closely with our um, partners in the issuer community to get that data. We are very close, um, but we don't have it today. We anticipate being able to share that by the end of the week, and then we'll be able to um, field questions on that when we come back to you next week. Great, so Dana, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Dana Houlihan from Diva. I just wanted to confirm that we have Wigley on the phone, or uh, Julie, Brittany, and Brooke? Julie, then. Brittany and Brooke are on as well. Excellent. Welcome. Thanks for joining. Okay. Hit the button to the right. here and do the slides. Here's a look at what our stakeholder group is comprised of. 
there are three of us at least from DIVA representing plan management and the outreach and, up, outreach and education area and our sister program, all interesting and very valuable perspectives. All of our issuers are closely involved. Staff from the um, Department of Financial Regulation and Remote Care Board, and of course from the Healthcare Advocate. We begin meeting in October each year and met regularly through last week, in fact. So we have very spirited discussion supported by Wigley Consulting to model plan designs and we discuss through um, various factors that I'll uh, touch on again uh, to come up with our proposal that you'll see today. I can say that we uh, don't always have consensus for any decision that has to be made, but I can say at the end of you know, when it's decision time, we have common understanding and our proposal is well supported by a broad-based stakeholder group. Very quickly, I want to just remind you of these uh, principles that we, that we that guide our decision making. We want plans that are compliant, that's a, that's a basic, and that uh, provide each of the essential health benefits, that's a must. We value affordability with the limited levers that we have, our decisions are balancing uh, premium, things that are likely to drive a premium up or keep it as steady as possible, um, as opposed to the member cost share. Those are the balancing uh, factors that we're always mindful of. We value stability for each plan and for the market as a whole. We try very hard to minimize large um, benefit changes that are likely to impact premium or lead to something that's um, hard for an uh, uh, enrollee to understand in their plan. Obviously, we want things that are plans that are attractive to new to existing enrollees and to uh, new customers. And then, of course, to actually use your plan. enrollees of all different ages and um, we emphasize maintaining the lowest cost possible for primary care and behavioral health services. Uh, we emphasize generic cost share wherever possible. Obviously no cost preventive services are required. So here's a little bit about our approach. Uh, very basically, as I said before, we, we try to uh, do minimal increases in a strategic way, balancing out that, um, the, on the one hand, something that may lead to a premium increase, and another being mindful of enrolling cost share for when someone actually needs to use their plan. Design innovations, wherever possible, again, we don't, we try not to implement anything that would be disruptive to either an enrollee in a particular plan or to the market as a whole. Um, but if something looks attractive, um, we consider it. I'll give more detail about this proposal to maximize AV as an example of that. And then consumer education is always a very important factor. It was especially challenging in 2019. Um, with the introduction of silver loading, as important and valuable as that was, it's important to help our existing enrollees and new customers understand what that's about, how it impacts them, and make sure that they're, uh, they understand their options. Switching now to the, um, the proposal made for 2020, uh, a maximum AV for silver plans. This was introduced by the healthcare advocate. Uh, in the fall, we, as a stakeholder group, gave it very careful and thorough consideration. The idea is that if we, if we wanted to maximize the AV for silver plans on the exchange with the goal of, by maximizing the 
AV, we intended to maximize the premium for the silver plans on exchange, which results in a higher benchmark plan premium. So that would benefit the, presumably that would benefit the um, subsidized and low leads with the assumption that, again, that um, the higher AV would lead to the higher premium for benchmark. And that off exchange, we would be able to design plans, corresponding plans off exchange to leave the unsubsidized customers unharmed. So that was the basic idea. Here's a summary of our, um, our discussion. Among stakeholders, it was a very strong and easy consensus around the, um, in support of maximizing APTC for the subsidized population, while at the same time wanting to protect the unsubsidized populations in silver plans. Moving to our analysis that showed that um, many of our, we looked at both the for this, uh, in this case, we looked at both on the uh, standard and non-standard silver plans. Many were already at within one percent of the maximum, which we, which is interesting to look at. Um, we also found from our analysis that benefit difference would be significant between a max AV silver plan on exchange and the corresponding lower AV silver plan off exchange. As an example, um, a deductible could be one or two thousand dollars greater in the max AV and then the lower AV off exchange, which means it would be very difficult to say that that's the same plan mm -hmm. um, or that they're a reflective plan because many. You know, many of the um, plans by name are identified by you know, the underlying benefits. So something with a significant benefit difference created that issue of well, what would we call that? Stakeholders were very concerned collectively um, about that messaging. With the experience of 2019 and explaining to our customers in silver plans what reflective silver meant, um, we were concerned with the prospect of having an even more confusing market in this for silver plans if we had a reflective plan and something else yet to be named with a lower AV off exchange. Having too many silver plans was a was a real concern that it would be overwhelming the market. Ultimately it led us led us to decide that we would not go forward with that proposal. And then as we were kind of working towards the end of our analysis, we learned in January that silver loading would be continued through 2020, which has a, a significant benefit to the uh, subsidized population. So that's where we landed. We would consider that again in future years. Okay, forward. Very briefly, um, as Eddie said, the silver loading concept will be moving forward in 2020. It was new for our market in 2019. And the basic idea is that the on exchange silver plan premium will contain the incremental cost for the CSR program. And then a corresponding plan, um, premium on the, for the off exchange silver plans would be lower. So in that, in that way, we're not going to cause any harm, or in fact, we would benefit the unsubsidized population in silver plans by providing a lower premium silver plan there. Um, on exchange, uh, an, eligible, an eligible applicant or enrollee could choose a silver plan with CSR if eligible, or they can take that APTC to another metal level, off exchange, excuse me, on exchange. Um, off exchange, again, um, silver plan customers would select a reflective silver plan. There are no reflective silver plans on exchange. 
And again, the benefit variation, the minor variation, is just a $5 copayment difference, a 5% coinsurance difference. And I should have included there a $25 um, deductible difference for the high deductible health plans um, applied to the ambulance or the emergency medical um, transportation benefit. And that was approved in 2019, and we proposed the same for 2020. And no impact on the other medical levels. Do you want us to hold all questions to the end, or? I, I mean, I think that's fine to go ahead if you have any. I'm just curious if you thought that um, if there's been any analysis done on if Vermonters um, truly figured out the silver loading and they ended up in the right plan and what you thought the success rate was? I think that will be a really good question for the next meeting when we can dig into the uh, enrollment figures okay. that we'll provide this week and then um, should address that specific question next week and among others. So the information we get will definitely uh, it will show the if movement of they were in the right plan or not for them. Yeah, it will show the migration okay. from 2018 to 2019. Very clearly by plan. I'm happy to just give a sneak preview. I mean, I think we okay. can safely say that there was not a 100% success rate. Right. Um, we found that for a number of reasons, customers, some customers did choose to stay in silver plans on the exchange that had the increased premium. Um, we did some more. Um, surveying them to see kind of what was driving that, if it was just a lack of understanding or there were actual reasons they wanted to stay on the exchange and we saw some of each. Um, so I think I think next week we'll have our um, data and enrollment specialist, Sean, who can kind of speak to more of those efforts. But just to give you a short answer, it was not 100%, but um, I think the message got out there um, and we'll be able to build on that next year. Can you share now what some of the reasons might be for them to stay? Um, I think what we heard was kind of stability, like the, the system hasn't been working great for a few years and now it's working well for me, and why would I, why would I change that? Um, and maybe a lack, it gets very complicated in the, um, the people who are uh, eligible for the Vermont cost sharing reduction in silver plans. and. Depending on what you're, what's driving those purchasing decisions, if it's you know um, just the deductible itself, there could be people who, even though it looks based on AP, like people would be better off in a higher in a gold plan, people could choose to stay in silver. So we saw a lot of that. That that was more complicated, I think, than we anticipated. And can I also ask a follow-up, which is, um, did you s another reason? I could see that someone would stay on exchange even if they're unsubsidized would be they own a small business, they don't know what their income's gonna be at the end of the year, and if they buy off exchange, they're no longer eligible for the APTC should they be in the right income range. Do you think that um, impacted any of the silver loading issues, or do you think those folks maybe are a little more savvy and would have bought up if you can, I mean, that might be too precise an example. No, I think that's a really good example. I can say that I don't think we, um, heard those stories in particular in our outreach, although the issuers are also doing outreach to the um, that population that doesn't receive subsidies, um, but may be staying on the exchange on purpose so that they can apply for the tax credit when they file their taxes. Um, and I think they, I think that the issuers did, or at least Blue Cross in particular, did find that be, to be a message that they heard back. So. Moving on very briefly, um, here's a high-level view of the next steps in our um, our annual cycle. As Eddie said, we're about a month later than we would normally present to you because of the delay in the release of the payment notice, including the 2020 federal AD calculator that's essential to uh, our plan design. So uh, we're making up time at the beginning of the process with a bit of a compressed timeline for um, Thank you, DFR, for um, compressing their time for, for form review. Uh, issuers will submit their forms to DFR um, mid to late March, which is a, a little bit later than the original um, timeline there. 
Um, we, as we, we will explain more in a minute, the um, payment notice and the uh, IRS limits. The payment notice is in draft form. IRS limits aren't uh, available yet. Those come from a different source. Expect them to be final in April. Then the rate uh, process from submission in May through the um, rate review and public hearing and decision in August that stays on track as originally planned. DIVA will complete or is targeting to complete its plan certification, which means formal selection of the specific QHPs to be offered on the exchange by the end of August for open enrollment to begin, as we know, November 1st. So we, these milestones are very uh, interconnected and locked in for um, each kind of building towards preparation for open enrollment in November. Okay, at this point I'd like to turn it over to uh, Wakely Consulting. I think Brittany will lead us through the slides. If you're willing. I'm sure everyone can hear them. And um, Brittany, just. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I just did a quick question before we jump into the, the details of the plan design. Um, can you remind us where things are legislatively with the bronze prescription drug maximum out of pocket? Um, because at one point that was time limited, and I've lost track of where that landed. Sure. Yeah, I, I probably should have mentioned that at the beginning with the other legislative changes. So in the last session, um, we uh, a, a bill was passed to make that indefinite. So we have the ability to design bronze plans that don't include the maximum out of pocket for prescription um, under state law. Thank you. Any other questions, or we can move on? Okay. Um, Brittany, if you'll just let me know what slide we're on, I'll drive it at this end. Okay, great. Thanks. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so, on slide 11, just a quick outline of um, our agenda and what we're going to go through. So, as Dana mentioned, um, the first couple of slides we're going to talk about are the proposed regulation changes. Um, for 2020 that are new um, compared to 2019, as well as changes in the federal actuarial value calculator for 2020. Um, and then we'll briefly talk through some notes and caveats we have on our um, analysis and presentation. Um, and then we'll finally get into the, the meat of the presentation, walking through all of the recommended plan design changes. Um, so stepping through from platinum down to bronze. So moving to slide 12, um, just a brief uh, couple notes on the changes from the 2019 um, regulations to the 2020 draft notice of benefit and payment parameters. Um, one thing we'll mention again in the notes and caveats is that these are just draft regulations. The final regulations haven't been released yet. Um, but based on the draft, the annual limitation on cost sharing is increasing to 8,200 from um, 7,900 in 2019. Um, so this represents a $300 increase, which is smaller than the increase from 2018 to 2019, which was I think around $550. Um, but it's, it's more in line with uh, prior year changes, which have ranged between two and $300 a year. Um, one item I want to uh, point out to pay attention to is that the proposed limit of 8,200 is actually based on a new calculation um, that's used to determine the change each year. Um, there was a note that in the final regulation, should the calculation revert um, back to the old calculation that's been used in prior years, this limit would actually be $8,000 rather than 8,200. Um, so this will come up a couple times throughout our presentation because this, these regulations are draft and this is subject to change. Um, that should that 8,200 go back down to 8,000, that will impact some of our plan designs. Um, and so we've made um, notes of that throughout the presentation on which ones would be impacted and, and our recommendation for handling that. Um, one other piece I want to note is that this limit does not um, apply to the high 
high uh, health savings account eligible, high deductible health plan. Um, that uh, maximum out of pocket and there's a minimum deductible um, associated with those plans is released by the IRS. Um, usually in the spring, it's usually released around April, so we do not have those um, limits yet either. Um, the pharmacy benefits, there, the draft regulations uh, included some additional flexibility around pharmacy benefits. Um, so issuers can add a generic equivalent drug um, and remove that um, associated brand drug from their formulary mid-year um, as long as they uh, notice, notify the, the members. Um, they can also accept certain brand drugs from counting towards the maximum out-of-pocket limit only um, when there's a generic available and only the generic equivalent amount would count towards the out-of-pocket maximum as well as um, accepting drug manufacturer coupons um, for specific brand drugs that have a generic equivalent from counting towards the out-of-pocket maximum. Um, so each of these regulations are really geared towards trying to um, encourage consumers to use a generic equivalent um, when it's available versus the brand equivalent and trying to control some of those pharmacy costs. Um, the other item we wanted to mention here in terms of changes to the regulations is silver loading. Um, as Dana mentioned, silver loading will continue through 2020, um, but uh, Health and Human Services are seeking comments. They specifically mentioned that in the draft regulation um, on whether to continue silver loading or how to address that in future years. So any changes um, could play, take place as soon as 2021, um, but they won't be in place for 2020. Um, and there's several other uh, changes to the regulations. Um, we didn't list them out here. Um, these are the ones that kind of specifically apply to plan designs. Others could impact other areas, uh, but, or plan designs, but not as directly. Um, so those are the ones we wanted to kind of draw attention to. So moving to slide 13, um, just a quick overview of the federal actuarial calcul value calculator um, for anybody who's new here this year or hasn't been involved in past years, we just wanted to give a brief overview. Um, Society, the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight releases a new calculator each plan year. Um, and it's required that this model be used to determine the actuarial value of a plan for determining compliance with the meta level. Um, the calculator has several different inputs for plan design features including deductible, out-of-pocket maximum, member cost sharing for about 20 different uh, service categories um, where you can input either co-pays or co-insurance and indicate whether the deductible applies or not. Um, it only includes about 20 different service categories, so there are um, some service categories that are explicitly included in the calculator. There are also some plan design features not supported um, by the actuarial value calculator. It's really kind of a simple um, plan design type tool. Um, so if the um, impact of any features that aren't supported by the um, ABC um, are considered substantial, an actuary can modify the inputs to either both closely resemble that plan design or can modify the results of the calculator um, to account for these features. And this would require an actuarial certification documenting um, the development of that modification. Um, so there are a, a few plan designs that we do to make adjustments for outside of the calculator um, on the Vermont standard plan design. This um, includes the silver and bronze um, plan designs, both the deductible and, and high, deductible, uh, high deductible health plan designs. Um, we also want to point out that the AB from the calculator is different from the pricing AB used by carriers in order to determine the premiums and changes to premiums year over year. Um, so the federal calculator is based on summarized national data, whereas the carriers are likely going to use their own experience. It's likely going to be specific to um, experience in Vermont. Um, so that, that experience underlying the calculator and the data underlying the calculator will be different. Um, and then each carrier likely has its own 
model and methodology for calculating that pricing AV that is likely different than the actuarial value calculator. Um, and again, some features and not all service categories are included in the ABC, so that's another way that um, the pricing AV and the, the actuarial value produced by the ABC could differ. Um, so on slide 14, just talking through some of the changes of uh, the federal calculator, um, there weren't significant changes um, and updates from 2019 to, 20, to, to the 2020 draft calculator. Um, overall, the underlying data was not changed. Um, it had been changed, I think, a couple years ago um, to reflect more recent experience. Um, rather, the CMS trended the data. Um, so from 2015, which is the, the base year that was used um, for the experience, to 2018, um, the medical claims were trended at a rate of 3.25% and 11.5% for pharmacy claims. Um, from 2018 to 2019, some slightly different trend rates were used, um, slightly higher trend rates. And then for 2019 to 2020, um, the medical trend of 6.1%, so an increase in the medical trend, and 9.8% for pharmacy, so a slightly lower increase um, were applied to get to an estimate of the 2020 um, claims experience that's underlying the calculator. Um, so even though there weren't significant changes to the calculator, primarily the trending of another year of data, um, there's still going to be changes required to the standard plan designs for 2020. Um, this is mostly due to the leveraging effect of trends. So to the extent that the underlying data was trended from 2019 to 2020, um, and say like the deductible and out-of-pocket maximums um, are kept at the 2019 level, <laughs> AV produced by the calculator will increase um, inherently under that because of that leveraging effect. So there's still gonna be changes required. Brittany, uh, Brittany uh, Member Powell has a question. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm looking on slide 14 at the phrase, despite the flexibility for states to redefine their um, <clears throat> essential health, health benefits. And I just want to make sure like I'm on track in understanding that. My understanding is that CMS uh, for, uh, for year 2020 and beyond has uh, kind of expanded the opportunity for states to uh, either uh, borrow other states' plans or borrow certain categories from other state plans or expand uh, their own plan. Um, and uh, my understanding was that Illinois for 2020 was the only state that did so. But I'm wondering as, as we look at our essential health benefits plan, is there any consideration, not for 2020, but for 2021 uh, to kind of take a look at uh, our essential benefits and uh, see how they're working, see whether relative to each other they're the best that we can do. Um, Brittany, maybe I'll just take a first um, response on that and then pass it back to you. Um, so I think certainly, so all of the benchmark plans for each state are it's public information. It would be extremely easy for us to review all of it. I mean, I think as you know, the, board really has jurisdiction in, in that area, um, though we've been very happy to support it. But um, when the changes were made federally, I think that we we talked in, in, um, in terms of a DIVA, DFR, and the Green Mountain Care Board about not not making a change when, when that flexibility was initially um, promulgated. But um, we're certainly happy to support looking into that, and we have contacts in all the states and would be able to um, access the benchmarks quite easily. I mean, I, I asked that question because I did go through all 50 states actually, okay. um, and not with a fine tooth comb, but uh, looking especially at some preventive measures where other states are, I think, a little bit ahead of us than, 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 than where we are. Um, but, I, but more generally, um, I'm just wondering whether or not, uh, you know, as we look at I mean, this is all still new uh, to a certain extent. Whether we look at the essential benefits that we have, uh, is there some process by which we say, yes, so we've got the right balance? Or over time, are we looking as they might morph over time um, and uh, certain adjustments might be needed? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we'd be really happy to engage in that conversation. I think we would largely defer to, to you all. So we, we should just talk about what that might look like in terms of the state process. Yeah, I think Eddie covered it. Um, one thing I will say, just in terms of the specific to the ABC, um, the data underlying the calculator is not updated to reflect any changes in the in the EHDs for the states. Um, so, the extent that Illinois, you know, did update their EHDs, that's not necessarily reflected in the underlying data um, used for the ABC. I actually have a follow-up question, not on the EHB, but on the differences between the federal. Uh, calculator uh, and I this may not be an answerable question so <laughs> feel free to tell me it's not but I was curious if there's any way to kind of generalize how uh, the federal data uh, you the federal data being in the ABC uh, it might either be a good or a bad thing for a state like Vermont, uh, where we probably have had higher mandated benefits over the years and may have uh, higher costs than other states for various reasons, and how sort of those two differences interplay between the premiums, which would be based on uh, the state data and uh, the federal AB calculator. And that may be something that's not answerable without us actually looking at the the data, because of course I know Wakely, you're not uh, engaged in our rate review process, so may not be as familiar with our state data in this area. Yeah, I think that my leader. Um, so we haven't adjusted the results of the ABC output for Cairo um, services in past years, and um, don't see um, a reason to change that approach for 2020. So we continue to not make any adjustments for these changes in the chiropractic copay um, for 2020. For physical therapy copays, um, there was no um, impact to the 2019 plan design for Act 7. Um, and so in 2019, these copays are aligned with the specialist copay um, consistent with prior years. Um, for 2020, uh, the same 125 to 150% of the PCP copay limit um, is applicable for physical therapy. Um, so, similar to chiropractic, we set the physical therapy copay is equal to 150% from down to the nearest $5 increment. Um, physical therapy is a service that's included in the actuarial value calculator. So, the ABs presented on the following slides do reflect this. Um, this change and in most cases a reduction to the physical therapy um, copay, and that's just as part of the, the calculator. It is one of the services included, so those changes are reflected. So slide 16, a couple notes and caveats. Um, I think most of these we, uh, we've kind of touched on so far. Um, but we just want to point out, so the 2020 regulations and federal calculator are still in draft format. Um, there could be changes in the final versions that could impact the actuarial values and therefore the resulting plan design. Um, comments on the draft regulations were due February 19th, um, and I think typically they look at 60 to 90 days um, to review those comments. So based on that timing, it's possible the final regulations and calculator may not be released until April. Um, this year. Um, the annual limitation on cost sharing in the 2020 draft regulations, as I had mentioned before, it was increased to $8,200 um, for 2020. However, um, should the final regulations revert back to the old calculation um, for that limit, the limit would be $8,000. Um, the federal HDHP minimum deductible and out-of-pocket maximum limits are not yet released for 2020. Um, so in 2019, these limits were 1350 and $6,750 respectively. Um, the proposed plan designs do not currently account for changes in either the minimum deductible or out-of-pocket maximum. Um, so should the final limit for the deductible increase, um, the pharmacy deductibles for the high deductible health plans will need to be adjusted. Um, so typically the minimum deductible increases $50 about every two to three years, um, and the last increase for, was for the 2018 plan year. 
um, so it may or may not increase this year, it's hard to say. Um, and the out-of-pocket maximum typically increases about $100 each year. Um, so should the out-of-pocket maximum increase um, from 2019 to 2020, um, we basically kept everything in line with this 2019 limit and wouldn't need to make additional changes to reflect that out-of-pocket maximum. In slide 17, um, the estimated premium impact, I mentioned that we showed a premium impact on the following slide. Um, these changes are meant to illustrate the trade-off between premium increases and the cost-sharing increases. Um, to Dana's point, trying to balance those two, two pieces. Um, the actual premium change is gonna be based on the carrier's model um, and their experience. Um, the premium impact that we're showing is based on a weekly benefit model. Um, and so it's, there's likely different methodologies and definitely different um, data underlying those calculations between what the carrier will use to ultimately determine the premium for 2020. Um, so we didn't adjust um, the weekly benefit model outputs for any benefit designs that aren't incorporated in the model or accommodated by the model. Um, so for example, the embedded um, drug out-of-pocket maximum on the high deductible health plan. Again, these are just meant to be kind of high-level um, estimates to illustrate the trade-off between those premium increases and cost-sharing increases, and so they don't exactly align with what the final um, premium change is going to be these plans. Okay. So Moving to slide 18, um, here's kind of a first look at the results of the 2020 draft ABC. Um, that table at the bottom of the slide shows the plan, each of the plans, what their 2019 final um, actuarial value was based on the um, federal ABC and what the 2020 draft result is. Um, and then on the right, we show the acceptable range of ABs for these plans to meet the um, federal requirements. So as you can see in this table, the gold, um, silver, and bronze deductible plans, the bronze deductible with drug limit plans, all are um, currently outside of the range just based on the 2019 plan designs and 2020 calculator. And so those three plans do require changes um, this year to meet the de minimis requirements. Um, one note on the silver plans is that the cost sharing reduction um, variation plan design will also require changes, um, and those changes um, depend on the final silver plan designs. Um, they're tied to that, that base silver plan. Um, even if changes are not required, so for the platinum um, run from deductible without the drug limit and the two HJHP plans. Um, we still uh, propose changes to those plan designs um, in order to avoid, you know, this AB increase being passed on through premium as well as to try and limit um, some of the changes that might be required in future years um, and make, you know, small incremental changes each year versus no changes one year and then quite large changes the next. Um, one item to know is that the acceptable AV ranges below have been adjusted for a, fall, for a couple plan design features that are not supported by the federal calculator. Um, we don't make specific adjustments for these, uh, for these design features, rather we leave um, what we call the cushion um, in the acceptable range in order to account for these designs. Um, so the first one is waiving the deductible for preventive prescription drugs. Um, this only applies to the HDHP plans and we've allowed a 0.5% cushion. Um, so you can see the silver HDHP plan has a high end of the range at 71.5% versus 72%. Um, in prior years, we also made an additional adjustment to reflect um, that there is no cost sharing for basic pediatric oral health um, EHB. Um, this adjustment was another 0.5% cushion on both the HDHP plans and the bronze deductible plan with the drug limit. Um, this adjustment has been removed for 2020 um, as part of the stakeholder meetings. 
Um, the carriers reviewed the historical experience for these services, and um, we estimated that the impact of this service is, um, to the AV is not significant. So based on that updated review of, of actual experience, we've actually removed that question. So um, the Bronx deductible plan with the drug limit, for example, the high end of the range is 62% this year, whereas in prior years, we estimated it to be at 61.5%. Um, and so that gives us a little bit more um, room in terms of the plan design changes um, that are required this year. So moving ahead to slide 19. Sorry, was there a question? No, I was just saying that I don't see any. Okay. Um, just as a reminder, uh, there are certain thresholds um, for plan design changes that do not require um, formal approval should the changes be below these thresholds. So on slide 19, we've just provided a summary of those, those changes. So copay changes less than or equal to $15, coinsurance changes less than or equal to five percentage points, um, deductible changes less than or equal to $200, and out-of-pocket maximum changes that are less than or equal to the increase in the federal limit. Um, so for this last one, for 2020, um, the proposed limit is 8,200 versus 7,900 last year, so changes less than or equal to 300 would not require a formal approval, as well as any modifications that are needed to meet federal guidance. Um, so in the following uh, slides, the recommended and alternative plan designs that we're showing, any changes from the 2019 plan designs are shown, um, they're shaded in orange and, and in boxes um, to try and highlight which, which items actually changed from the 2019 plan design. Um, any changes that also require um, board approval are shaded in green. So that we, um, just to highlight which ones are um, requiring formal approval. So slide 20, we've provided just a summary of the changes um, between the 2019 plan design and the proposed um, 2020 plan design. Um, we'll go through all these in a little bit more detail on the following slides. Um, so the pieces that I do want to point out is that um, all of the plan designs, except for the platinum deductible plan and silver high deductible health plan, have changes that are above um, the thresholds that we just went through on the prior slide and would um, do require um, GMCB approval. Coming through is more yellow than green, but it's <laughs> easy. Um, so then on slide 21, just a couple other items that we want to know. Um, so should the federal limit um, be finalized at $8,000 rather than $8,200? Um, what we've shown as the recommended plan design has an embedded out-of-pocket maximum of $8,200. Um, and this is tied to that federal limit. So should that limit reduce, we will reduce the embedded out-of-pocket maximum on the HJHP plans to be $8,000. Um, but no other plan design changes are required should that happen. Um, for the bronze deductible plan with the pharmacy limit, um, the recommended plan design will not meet the AV requirements with an $8,000 out-of-pocket maximum. Um, we'll, we'll show that in a few slides, but right now it's set at a $8,200 out-of-pocket max. Um, so in that case, we're also requesting approval to move to the alternative design should it be required based on that federal out-of-pocket maximum limit if it is finalized at $8,000 rather than $8,200. Um, and then again, we um, the formal approval is not required for out-of-pocket maximum changes less than or equal to the federal change. Um, so with the $8,200 limit, this is a $300 change, but should that limit be reduced to $8,000, this would only be a $100 change. And so more of the out-of-pocket maximum changes um, would actually require the formal approval um, than what we've shaded on the prior slide. So we're also requesting approval for those changes um, to the out-of-pocket maximum as we proposed here, um, regardless of whether the final federal change is $100 or $300. Um, so those are all the pieces that we're really um, 
requesting approval for. Um, we can talk about it a little bit more as we look at the specific plan designs, but just to kind of give you an overview of the items to, to be looking for it for the next few slides. Okay. Are there any questions? I'm going to pause just briefly before we start getting into the actual plan design. Guess we're good. Okay. Let's see. I mean, thank you. Yes, we're good. Great. So I'm on slide 22. So as I mentioned, we'll start with the platinum plan and move down to the bronze plan. Um, each our kind of format for going through the plan design is going to be similar for all the plans. The first slide is the history of the plan designs from 2014 to 2019. Um, and then we'll take a look at the recommended plan designs. Um, and then there's a third slide for each plan design that kind of talks through um, our reasoning behind um, the recommended design and the changes we've proposed. So starting with the platinum plan, um, there's been there really weren't any changes from 2014 to 2016 on the platinum plan design. Um, from 2017 to 2019, the deductible, the medical deductible has increased um, each year. The out-of-pocket maximum for both um, the medical and the pharmacy limit have been increased a couple times. Um, and the specialist office visit and preferred brand copay were increased back in 2017. Um, but we really haven't made any changes to the PCP or generic copays or several of the um, cost sharing associated with different service categories. So looking at the 2020 recommended plan designs, um, on this slide, the 2019 plan design is in the, the second from the left column. Um, and then we show the, our recommended plan design and an alternative design. Um, for each of these plans. So as we noted before, the Platinum plan does not actually require any changes from the 2018 design. It still meets the um, AV requirements under the 2020 draft calculator. Um, however, we um, are recommending several changes to the co-pays um, in order to limit the impact on premium, as well as, as you mentioned, try to make you know, smaller incremental changes each year um, versus no changes and then larger changes required in future years. Um, so under the recommended plan design, we're recommending a $5 increase to the TCP co-pays, a $10 increase to the specialist co-pays, um, as well as a $5 increase to the generic co-pays. Um, urgent care and ambulance, um, what we have done in past years and on prior and on the other metal levels is that urgent care, um, the urgent care copay equal to ten dollars greater than the specialist copay, um, and the ambulance copay ten dollars greater than the urgent care copay. Um, so we're also recommending ten dollar increases to those services um, to maintain that um, relationship between those services and the specialist copay. Um, and then you'll also know, kind of in the middle of the slide, the chiropractic and physical therapy co-pays. Um, we've changed those to be 150% of the PCP copay. Um, and then really those two services are the difference between the recommended design and the alternative design. Um, Act 7, which we mentioned before, and I think I meant, forgot to point this piece out specifically, but that Act 7 um, only applies to silver and bronze plans. Um, so even though that regulation does not necessarily apply to the platinum deductible plan, um, through our, our discussions um, that we've been having, uh, the recommended design does apply that same requirement um, in order to maintain the consistency among the metal levels and um, try and, you know, impact the maintain that consistency for consumers um, and reduce some of that confusion possibly between those differences among the metal levels. Um, I'd move to slide 24. Sure. Yeah, and the other the other piece on slide 24 that I did want to mention, I, I kind of mentioned this when we we're looking at the historical plans, but the PCP and generic pharmacy co-pays have 
never been increased um, since the 2014, the first year the standard plan designs were, were in place. Um, so by doing the, the $5 increase this year, it, again, kind of keeps these changes in line with the other meta levels um, as well as we'll see. Are there any comments or questions on the recommended design for the platinum deductible plan? It doesn't appear so. I think we're all good. Okay. All right. So moving to slide 25, <laughs> we'll take a look at the gold deductible plan. Um, Again, looking at just the historical plan design from 2014 through 2019, um, similar with the platinum plan, no changes were actually made to this design between 2014 and 2016. Um, the deductible has really only been raised once in 2017, um, and then there's been a couple changes to the out-of-pocket maximums as well. Um, for this plan design, uh, kind of similar to Platinum, we, the TCP copay has never been increased. Um, we did increase the generic pharmacy copay um, in 2019, um, as well as made some changes to the specialist office visit copay and preferred grant copay back in 2017. So the, the changes have been spread out across several different service categories. Um, So on slide 26, um, the 2020 recommended design um, proposes a $50 increase to the medical deductible, so from $850 to $900. Um, it also includes a $300 increase to the medical out-of-pocket maximum, um, a $5 increase to the PCP copay, um, and then a $20 increase to the specialist office visit. Um, and again, urgent care and the ambulance co-pays um, are, we've, we've tied them to the specialist office visit to keep that relationship consistent. So $20 increases to both of those as well. Um, again, similar to the platinum plan design, um, the chiropractic and physical therapy co-pay limits um, in the recommended design actually do not represent a change, but that's um, really to keep the those copays at 150 percent of the PCP copay. Um, so again, even though Act 7 does not um, apply to platinum and gold plans, uh, the recommended design keeps that uh, does apply that limit um, in order to maintain consistency. Um, one other item I want to know: um, it is a large increase that we're suggesting for the specialist copay. Um, Twenty dollars is quite a bit higher than some of the other changes to co we've, we've made in the past and on other meta levels. Um, the reason for that is in looking at the plan design um, for all of the other meta levels, that specialist copay is two and a half to three times the TCT copay. Um, and so in order to maintain that relationship, um, that's where the $20 um, <coughs> increase came. We noted that you know, in 2018, it had the, the smallest ratio between the specialist uh, copay and PCP copay at just two times. Um, so again, that $20 increase maintains that consistency in terms of the relationship between the PCP and um, specialist copays. I'm curious if anybody at DIVA has concerns about uh, the chiropractic change given the legislative history. They were trying to link it closer towards primary care, I thought, and uh, this will uh, make it substantially different. Well, it brings in the same proportion. Yeah. Uh, okay. was right. And it was, it was thought, too, that it would be a benefit to have it consistently applied to each of the metal levels, even though it's not required for a platinum and gold. What would be helpful for me is to understand why Act 7 set it at the same level as primary care in 2019, but then allowed for the variation between 125 and 150% of primary care for 2020. Okay, if we know what the rationale or the thinking was. 
Uh, my recollection is that it was deemed easier to just put it either at primary care or specialist by the issuers um, as opposed to coming up with some essentially third tier or middle range. Um, so the timeline that we had to work on for 2019, as you know, was so compressed. Right. So I think, I think that that was kind of meant to be just like a transitional tool, bringing it down to the primary care level. And then I think from a policy perspective, the idea was it should not be linked to the specialist uh, copay and should be, there should be some flexibility to keep it a little bit lower than that. So, but I don't want to speak for the committees, but I think that that's what I remember from the legislative conversation. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, 180 legislators probably have different ideas of why <laughs> they did it. I just remember Senator Sorok and trying to make an argument that for many people, chiropractors were primary care providers. So that's, that's why I asked the question. And I think that one of the driving factors was that in these bronze, I think it was just in the bronze plan, but maybe in the silver, having the copay at the specialist level was um, leading to situations where the copay was actually more than the cost of the service, it was particularly for follow-up services in chiropractic care. Um, so that was, I think, in partic a particular concern to, um, you know, obviously copay should be less than what the actual underlying cost is. Any other questions on the gold design proposal? No. Okay. So moving to slide 28, looking at the silver deductible plan. Um, again, this, this slide just provides the history of the reference point um, of the historical changes. So the medical deductible and the out-of-pocket maximum have increased pretty consistently about each year. Um, pharmacy deductibles increased a couple times, as well as some changes to um, the PCP specialist co-pays um, and pharmacy co-pays back in 2016. Um, so slide 29, looking at the recommended design, um, we've made several different changes across um, several service categories in the recommended design, so increasing both the medical and pharmacy deductible as well as the out-of-pocket maximum. Um, we also increased the CCP specialist co-pays um, and the co-insurance that applies to uh, most facility services, so inpatient, outpatient, radiology. Um, and again, the chiropractic and physical therapy co-pays, these are set at 150% um, of the PCP co-pay per Act 7. Um, so those are really uh, tied to the PCP copay and the changes we're making there. Um, so you can see from 2019 to 2020, because of that limit, the physical therapy copay is actually um, decreasing $25. Um, so both um, the recommended and alternative plan designs are at the high end of the, the AV range. Um, the 2019 plan design was actually at 73.4% based on the 2020 calculator. So required about a one and a half percent reduction to um, the AV in order to get it back in compliance with the um, actuarial value calculator. Um, and the difference between the recommended and the alternative design is really, um, so in order to keep the co-insurance at 40% um, for inpatient and outpatient radiology, um, it included additional increases to the medical deductible and pharmacy deductible um, in order to, to maintain that co-insurance level and still maintain the, um, meet the AV requirements. I'd like to add here, there was a lot of stakeholder discussion around this plan. It was back and forth. We were concerned about raising those uh, co-insurances for inpatient and outpatient and felt it was warranted to as a trade-off to keeping a lower deductible increase. The deductible increase is one of the main levers to bring down the, the AV, but we wanted to keep that increase as low as possible. The other models that we looked at were considerably more than the four and um, $700 you see here, so. When you were having a discussion around this in the stakeholder group, did you look at uh, 
any examples or um, other <coughs> kind of relativities that between the, the coinsurance and the out-of-pocket max. So for example, at, for some inpatient stays at 50% coinsurance, you'd probably hit your medical out-of-pocket max rather than pay the full 50%. I was just curious if we have any sense of that, like whether that would be a rare, I mean, I know it depends on the inpatient stay, so this is a hard thing to look at, but just trying to get a sense of like how often with a 50% coinsurance are people gonna hit their out-of-pocket max, um, or do we think that most common inpatient stays, they'd still be paying less than that? This is Julie. I can try. I, looked at, I think the short answer is we did not look at that this year. I know we have looked at the past in terms of how some of the plan design changes impact people with different benefits, et cetera. Um, I, I do agree. I mean, you're looking at a you know 50 percent coinsurance, and you know, there's really only you know um, you know 40 70 dollars between your deductible and your and your maximum out of pocket. You know, so you double that, and most inpatient stays are going to, you know, to hit that amount. Um, you know, if you're staying a couple of days, you're likely to hit it. So we didn't look at that specifically, but I do agree that majority of people with inpatient stay are likely to hit the maximum out of pocket. So they, they would likely pay to be paying the 50% for, for a very short period of time. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Don't move here, so. Okay. I'm going to be conscious of time and keep us moving. So, um, on slide 31 um, is the silver high deductible health plan. Um, kind of similar changes. Uh, the medical deductible um, actually went down between 2015 and 16 and then back up. So, um, the deductible is actually in 2019 at the same level it was back in 2014. Um, we've also made some uh, incremental increases to the out-of-pocket maximum and co-insurances um, over the years. So looking at the recommended plan design for 2020, um, this plan is another one of the plans that does not require changes um, in order to meet the limit, but we are recommending some um, incremental increases in order to, again, um, small increases this year can help offset um, increases that might be required in future years, as well as try to offset some of the premium impact from um, just the leveraging effect. So our recommended plan design is an increase to the medical deductible um, from 1550 to 1700, um, as well as $100 increase to the medical out-of-pocket maximum um, the alternative design also increased the generic and preferred brand uh, co-pays, um, but had a smaller increase to the medical deductible. Um, and for the recommended design, it was, felt, it was more important to keep the generic uh, co-pay at the same level um, versus the $50 increase to the medical deductible. Um, and also one thing I want to note here is in the, the box on the right, but we have reviewed both of these plan designs with an $8,000 embedded out-of-pocket maximum, um, and both would continue to meet the AV requirements. So again, should the final regulation um, have a, a, an annual limit at $8,000, um, that embedded out-of-pocket maximum would be, would be lowered, but these plan designs um, would continue to meet the requirements otherwise. Should we move, move on or any questions yes, please? Okay, you want bronze, I think. Yeah, so I'm on, I'm on slide 34, um, the bronze deductible plan with the pharmacy limit. Um, Again, looking at the history for your reference, the medical deductible and pharmacy deductible have been increased pretty consistently throughout the years, um, as well as the medical out-of-pocket maximum. Um, but the copays have been largely untouched. There were a couple changes to the specialist copay, the preferred brand copay, but other than that, it's pretty much untouched. Um, so looking at the 2020 recommended plan design, 
Um, we're increasing the medical deductible um, from $5,500 to $6,000, as well as the pharmacy deductible from $900 to $1,000, um, and the out-of-pocket maximum to the annual, the draft limit of $8,200. Um, again, the chiropractic and physical therapy co-pays um, are being reduced to be 150% of the TCP copay, or I should say chiropractic is increasing, physical therapy is decreasing. Um, that's required per Act 7. Um, the alternative design made some additional changes to the medical deductible and pharmacy deductible, um, and that's really in order to bring the out-of-pocket maximum down to $8,000. So under this plan design, the recommended design does not continue to meet the AB requirements um, if the 8200 needs to be reduced to 8000 And so the alternative design um, is, would be our recommended design should the final um, regulation confer the $8,000 rather than 8200 Can you remind us again of the timing of that final regulation? So as of right now, the timing is somewhat unknown. Um, our best estimate is sometime in April um, when those final regulations will be released, but uh, it could be could any time around there. Okay. Thank you. Any questions on this, this uh, plan design? Don't see any. Okay. Sounds like we can move on to the next plan. Yep. Great. Okay. So the next plan is the bronze deductible plan without the pharmacy limit. Um, this plan design is new in 2018, so we really only have a couple years of historical designs associated with this plan. Um, so from 2018 to 2019, we increased the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum. Um, for 2020, we're recommending a similar increase um, to both the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum. Um, again, the chiropractic and physical therapy co-pays um, are being changed in order to meet the requirements of Act 7. Um, this plan design is another one that does not require changes in order to meet the AB requirements, um, but again, we're recommending changes um, in order to offset some of that premium impact. The alternative plan design actually makes um, the only change to those chiropractic and physical therapy limits as required to meet Act 7. See no questions. All right, we're down to the last plan design, the bronze high deductible plan um, on flight 40. Again, kind of similar to the, the changes we've made to the silver high deductible plan. Um, historically, the medical deductible and ad hoc maximums have increased relatively consistently, um, as well as the embedded out of pocket maximum has increased um, each year to tie to the um, annual limitation um, released in the final reg. So for the 2020 plan design, um, again, this one does not uh, require changes in order to meet the AP requirements, but we are recommending some changes to the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximum in order to um, help offset some of the premium impacts. Um, the alternative design um, only increases the out-of-pocket maximum and not the medical deductible, so has a slightly higher um, AB and slightly higher premium impact estimate. Um, again, similar to the silver high deductible plans, both plans have been run with the $8,000 out-of-pocket maximum, and both would meet the um, AB requirements should that um, embedded out-of-pocket maximum need to be reduced based on the final regulation. Okay, let's keep going. Great. Okay, so slides 43 and 44, um, we've actually seen already, this is the summary of plan design changes. Um, so the changes to each plan design we're making, as well as shading which ones require formal approval. Um, this is just to kind of remind everybody what those changes are. 
Um, and then 44, again, mentions the changes to the $8,000 out-of-pocket maximum um, should the final regulation be reduced from, say, 200 in the draft regulation. We've also provided some appendices um, starting on slide 46 um, that I just want to point out. So these Appendix A, the CSR plan design changes, um, as we mentioned, those are tied to the silver recommended plan designs. Um, those changes don't require formal approval, but we've provided what those plans look like here for your reference. Um, Appendix D um, contains the summary of all of the recommended plan designs for all of the different metal levels. So you can see the progression from platinum to bronze, um, from the platinum to bronze plan side by side. And then Appendix C on the very last slide um, includes the silver on and off exchange plan design. So these are the on exchange plans and then the reflective um, silver off exchange plans. So we won't go through, we don't need to go through those, especially with the, the timing we have left, but I did want to point out that those were um, in the back of the slide deck for your reference. Super, thank you. Any questions from the board? I just have a quick comment, which is uh, thank you very much. I know everybody's been scrambling with the lateness of the federal notice. Um, I did not, uh, given the timing of, of when we got the slides last night, I didn't actually thoroughly digest them before today because our meeting started at 10. So I may have some additional questions that I'll shoot. I'll figure out with Susan who the right staff person to shoot those over. Um, and I'll try to send them my and, way and I'll just Great. Um, but I would think that if, I'm assuming I'm probably not the only person on the board who didn't totally digest the presentation between 5 and 10. So um, maybe we can coordinate getting all our questions together and get them to you maybe by Friday so that you'll have a little time to prepare if we, if we have others. So that, that was going to be my suggestion. So Susan, I'm assuming that uh, we've opened up a period of public uh, comment on the website? Um, it is an open at this time, it will be by the time we get back to the office. Okay. It will be open today. Okay. And that period will last how long? I believe it's two weeks, but... I think they're both scheduled for the 27th. So that's only that's a week. A week. So... Sorry. Okay. I think the challenge is um, the timing with the uh, form filing in March. Yes. Kind of keep it yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's no question we would have liked to have gotten the information earlier, but yeah. it is what it is. So, uh, so I would suggest Thursday. Yeah. Or, sorry, Tuesday. Tuesday. Right. The 26th. Okay. So at this time, we'll open it up to any member of the public for any comments or questions. Yes, Dale. Um, I guess one would be. Do not read after three o'clock in the afternoon if you want to sleep at night. <laughs> um, you want a disclaimer for future presentations? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I heard you say what you said, so I, not after three. Um, or maybe not until the weekend or not. Okay. Um, there is such a thing as getting so expensive the quality doesn't matter <coughs> because the shock will kill you anyways. <laughs> I actually had somebody on Facebook that was describing this and it, it, was, it was the most horrible story to read, but it was even more horrible when you realized it was true. They had a stroke, then they had a heart attack, and then they, and they were posting their story as they went, which I don't mind, but in this case, I just want to say this was very respectful. They, they were sharing because they were concerned about healthcare costs. And every step of the way, you could see something positive happening as far as, oh, the miracle treatment, it helped. The stroke wasn't as bad as it would have been. The heart attack wasn't as bad as it would have been. And then you would see a comment after that where it was like, I just had another stroke. I got the bill. 
I think it's a big one. And the whole thing just kept getting worse. And what I realized as I read it is the shock of the cost made totally error just not relevant what the quality was. They, they were buried for the rest of their life and they knew it and there was no way to recover. So I was looking at the charts and I saw how it, it, it had generally increased. I listened to the conversations over there in terms of we need more revenue. This is going to go up. And I'm trying to put this all in my head and not have it explode as far as get a general picture of how much cost are we looking at that every single person is going to have as a, a cumulative cost? And it's it's just a terror to look at. It, it, it's like Frankenstein isn't even scary anymore. Um, I don't know what to do with this. Wages aren't going up. Uh, do people leave the state? I, I think that's not even an invalid comment in the sense of do they start panicking and looking for someplace more affordable? Do they? It's getting really scary as far as we're trying to do something better. But has the cost got so high that better isn't the final statement? It's simply it's unaffordable. I think you hit the, the key point affordability and when you look at it, it what really scares me is that um, even somebody with insurance is going to be petrified to use it because of their out-of-pocket expenses. So, yeah. Yep. Get it. Walter. Uh, if I just want to back up a comment Robin made and then that Dale just made. I just got forced off of my Medicaid and I'm now on these exchanges and I have <coughs> prescriptions I have to fill and all that. I got a 50 cent raise at my job in the winter and that put me over the edge and I've been looking at all of this and wondering, A, as Dale had said, what will this cost in dollars and cents instead of percents? Because none of us understands percents. The second problem is, is that how is this affordable for a Vermonter, for Vermonters at all? Um, this is not affordable. Uh, I too have seen those problems with people being bankrupted by medical care even with insurance. And I may be one of them now. I've already been through this before with the huge costs that you have even with insurance. Um, so this, you know, all these cost raises really prove once again that market-based health care just does not work. For, you know, it may work for a few, but it doesn't work for the many. And you know, as someone that's just got to face this now, am I going to have to stop prescriptions because they're too bloody expensive? Um, and no more treatments. You know, I need knee surgery. That's off until I get Medicare because you can't afford it. You can't afford the deductibles. So it's more a comment, not a question, but I wish people would put in, instead of like 61.2 accurate value, put in the how much it is. Oops. The uh, problem, though, in this is that you have to look at what particular plan you have, yeah. what your particular health experience is <coughs> as far as medications and things like that. So it, it truly is an individual calculation. Yeah, I haven't been able to do that yet. I just got kicked off today, so. You know, there, there's nothing that bothers me more than to hear stories of the, the benefit cliffs. Oh, when yeah. somebody gets a 50 cent raise and they lose, it, it's just terrible. That's um, America. <laughs> um, that's kind of somewhat related. I, I thought yeah. that we were ending the part of the conversation having to do with the, the plans in specific, and I did have want to ask Diva a question. Uh, that deals with affordability. That's sure. Okay. That's Go ahead. Sure. So I, <clears throat> um, you know, the work that uh, Sean Sheehan and, and Agatha did in terms of building that chart uh, on affordability, which you know, as these folks are indicating, is quite stark. That 
Um, you can look at if you're three hundred ninety nine percent of federal poverty poverty level um, for the low cost bond plan, you're looking at one hundred and fifty dollars a month premium. And if you just go to the other side of that line, at four hundred and one percent of that federal poverty level, it's eight hundred and fifty two dollars a month. Um, and so, um, so that is of concern to me. Um, it's also of concern that as you kind of climb up the ladder, even with 500% of poverty, there are folks that it's just not affordable. As soon as you get across that line, you're looking at 13, 14% just in premium. So I'm, um, and then putting on my old hat, I went and looked at the uh, appropriation recommendations for um, <clears throat> for the QHP assistance, uh, you know, in the budget. Um, and we're looking at an increase from 2019 to 2020 from $8.1 million to about $8.22 million. It's a 1.2% increase. And on a per member per month basis, it's actually a 3% decrease. So I'm, uh, I'm just worried that there are two worlds here that are heading in different directions and that things are getting worse before they get better. And uh, so I'm, um, <clears throat> For me, I've never been able to solve a problem that I can't define. And I'm just wondering if um, you folks at DIVA could spend some time trying to calculate what it might cost in additional subsidies to get people at the 9.8% threshold um, in terms of their percent of income for those between 400% of poverty and 500% of poverty, um, as well as kind of um, uh, you know, looking for resources I mean, the, the uh, silver loading did, did a great job in terms of the affordability of premiums, um, but it didn't help everybody. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I listen to these, I, I feel this, and then I look at these increases going up, and they are heading in different directions, and I, I'm just looking for ways to begin to define what we might do to fix this problem, because it is fixable, it's not God-given, it is fixable. Um, and it all depends on where we want to invest our resources. And, uh, but um, it would just be helpful to have some fiscal measure of what it would take uh, to keep affordability within that 9% range um, uh, so that then you know, we can go after the solution. I'll just briefly say uh, we're very happy to help with modeling. I mean, Expanding the Vermont Premium Assistance Program is a legislative decision. So we just, you know, obviously, we, we are not the, <laughs> the only people at the table in that conversation, but very uh, happy to help. Yeah, I fully really appreciate the complications of I it. Mean, you can't, because of the, the waiver, you know, that, that sets limits at 400% of poverty, and the VPA is 300%, of but I understand that. But all that can be changed if, um, if you can't change it unless you kind of put it out front and center so people can really see the problem. Um, and in my experience, I found that once you can define the problem, people are helpful to try to find a solution. Uh, I think we very much agree and are quite focused on that issue of the unsubsidized population and affordability in that area. Okay, are there other comments or questions from the public? Walter. To back up Tom, to make a good point, uh, if you, it, would it be a good idea to have somebody like myself or Dale or who's actually on these plans or to be part of that conversation? Or I mean, you made a really good point, and I'm just trying to back it up. Well, I mean, I, I think at some point soon, um, maybe the board should hold a meeting just on uh, the deeper budget where resources are going. Um, you know, just more, more broadly, I'm looking at the, <clears throat> the amount of money just for medical care overall. And uh, in the <clears throat> 2019 budget, it's at $669 million. At the 2020, governor's recommended $608 million. So there's actually a decrease there, yeah. which affects hospitals. Um, and because this is where Medicaid rates get built out of, uh, out of this budget. But, you know, you can look at some expenditure areas <coughs> that um, at the closeout of last year, there was a $74 million that kind of accrued from the snafus with Vermont Health Connect largely, and now that's being held as a reserve. Uh, wearing my old hat, I think mm -hmm. that's a good thing. 
and the state needs reserves, but maybe it doesn't need all of it. Uh, and the budget adjustment this year in terms of um, global commitment funds was a $24 million increase. Um, if you look at the DEVA's administration budget, it's gone up $34 million in the last two or three years. So there's money being spent, and maybe this is the way it has to be spent, but maybe it isn't. And I'm just kind of trying to weigh the equities here of folks that are in the situation like you are and other folks that I know, um, that is there a different balance or are we just stuck where we're at? Yeah, I mean, most of, I mean, I know so many people who just go without because they can't afford it, you know, whether the millions of dollars, it doesn't. And the thing to remember is that when you talk in all those figures, which you're right, we pay them. We're the payers for all those figures. And I'm just, people just look at me and they just, they just say to heck with it, I can't afford it anymore. And that's the real problem. Yes, Dale. To just <laughs> the conversation, I'll put it that way. But building on, on your point, this really bothers me because the more it becomes an affordability issue and it becomes an acute affordability issue, it's tax time where I get reminded every year that we're actually trying to go in the direction of people must have health care. We're trying to make it mandatory. Um, when I apply for certain benefits, I have to turn in my income tax return to get the benefits, which also shows that I have health care. It's even got a, a spiral effect where um, if you don't do one thing, everything unravels all the way down the spiral staircase. So there's even more at risk here. And I see that every tax season as an example. If you, let's say, don't have health care, you fill out your taxes. So you have to fill out the taxes it's going to be listed as you don't have health care. You're going to get a penalty. If you did get the penalty, if we go that direction, <coughs> what happens down the road as far as everything else? Or what, let's say the person decides, I'm not going to fill out my taxes until the last minute. But they got other benefits that are now going to be affected because they didn't apply. Is that making sense? It does, but it's a legislative decision. We're not going to decide whether there's a penalty or not here at the, the board. Um, so that proper discussion would really be over in the legislative committees. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're going to see numbers show up here in your charts that's going to reflect that if, if as a population issue. So, yeah. It, yep. I, I just wanted to highlight that. No. The, it's a message heard loud and clear. Any other public comment? If not, I guess we want to thank our friends from Diva and from Wakely on the phone. Um, we've learned a lot, but we've tried to cram a lot into our heads in a short period of time, and we need a little time to digest this information. So we look forward to coming back to this next week, and we will um, try to get some responses to you by the end of this week. Great. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. So we're going to transition and uh, move on to uh, a discussion with UVM about mental health. So I thought I saw Dr. Drumstead come in.
So who's who is leading the team? Okay. <laughs> I got the peanut gallery. <laughs> very, very proudly. <laughs> and whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? We can. All right, thank you. Honorable Chairman Mullen, members of the Green Mountain Care Board, on behalf of the UVM Health Network colleagues, I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide the third quarterly update on our inpatient psychiatric planning project. I'll start with an overview today, and then I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Eve Kaur, Director of um, Strategic and Business Planning. She's going to give you an update on the data analysis from our last update. That will be followed by Eric Miller, our Senior Vice President and General Counsel, who will give you a little bit more detail on the IMD regs. And then it will be followed by Robert Pertini, Chair of the uh, Department of Psychiatry and co-chair with me on this project. And I'll close out the presentation. So again, just to set the stage for what we're trying to achieve with this initiative is to provide analysis, engagement, and planning necessary to achieve a desired, um, to design and create a UVM Health Network inpatient psychiatric facility that will substantially improve access to inpatient mental health care as part of our integrated delivery system here in the state. Again, we're trying to do this um, by designing and creating a, a health network-wide inpatient facility uh, on the Central Vermont Medical Center campus that will substantially improve access to inpatient mental health care. We're trying to anchor all of this in a data-driven, evidence-based pro process to the degree possible, and most importantly, to provide a forum for interested stakeholders so that they can provide input into the planning process um, and we have, as we've mentioned in the past, identified a, a team of stakeholders that meets quarterly, the inpatient planning stakeholders group, um, and uh, that, that group is ongoing at this point. We're also trying to create opportunities to share the information publicly, including public forums, legislative briefings, media relations, et cetera. Um, again, just the outline of how this process is structured. We do have an overarching um, steering committee that meets quarterly. We have a psychiatric inpatient capacity planning committee. And then we have uh, stakeholder engagement through PIPs. We are in uh, completing the first phase of this project and we will be entering phase two, and which will be focusing more on the design and operational requirements. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Eve. That's going to give you a refresh on the uh, data analytics. Thank you. Good afternoon. I just wanted to go back to um, the current state. Um, this is the inventory of the number of adult inpatient psychiatric beds that we have available um, around the state. And this is a slight update from the slide that we presented to you last time that we were here. We have included that the numbers really haven't changed. There are still 137 general adult inpatient psychiatric beds. But we did include 63 focused beds that are available um, at the Brattleboro Retreat and at the VA. Um, and we thought um, it important to add those again to, to this list. And this was included in our, in our report. So importantly, of those 137 beds, 45 are the level one designated beds, and about 92 are uh, general, if you will, inpatient for adult inpatient um, psychiatric needs. And if you remember from our last presentation, when we look at the number of those beds that are currently covered today under that IMD waiver, that number is about is 63, so it's very little less than 50% of all those general inpatient psychiatric beds um, are covered under that IMD waiver today. Our estimate of the number of additional adult inpatient psychiatry beds that we need has stayed pretty stable, um, at least at this, 
for this phase of the analysis. So I'll remind you of how we got to that, um, that final number of 29 to 35 additional beds. We looked at those patients who received inpatient psychiatric treatment but had to wait in our EDs for long lengths of time often um, before they got that bed. And so the five to nine bed component of that total estimate was the number of beds we needed to reduce delays for those patients who did receive inpatient psychiatric care but had to wait sometimes a long time to get to that bed. So five to nine days. Then the second component, if you recall, was using the most recent 12 months of actual data for patients in our EDs, um, who came to our EDs, finding that segment of patients who would have, likely would have taken an inpatient bed had one been available. And we call that the unmet need group. And again, if we model their arrival in the ED, um, if you recall, we looked at their length of stay and assumed that their length of stay was that lower acuity group. We randomly selected from that distribution curve. Long story short, we came up with about 18 to 20 beds for that unmet need group. Um, and then we looked at forecasted growth in inpatient, um, in inpatient patient days from our intelligence partner, SG2, and we came up with six additional beds that were needed. And I'll remind you, this, um, this six beds reflected a 4%, a very modest 4% growth um, in inpatient days, and that reflected SG2's um, belief that we'll see an increase in shift in care from inpatient to outpatient. Um, that we'll see um, reduced length of stay from new treatment modalities that will, will come um, onto the scene and so on and so forth. So that is the reason for the modest growth rate. In contrast, SG2's forecast for growth on the outpatient side is 9%. Um, so you can see how that, how that works there. Just a quick uh, recap of what's going on. We mentioned last time that 80% of the patients who come to our inpatient um, psychiatric units um, come through our EDs. Um, so if we break down what's going on in the EDs, another way to look at this is that unmet need group, remember we went to great lengths to, to say not everyone who comes to our EDs needs inpatient care. It's a, it's a very small subset. And if you recall, what we did was we took all the patients who came from the, um, that group of patients who stayed in the ED for 28 hours or more, and one out of five who came from the 12 to 28 hour group. That was backed by, um, by some chart reviews and so on and so forth. So that number of patients was 617 over the 12 month period. But I wanted to emphasize that if you look at the number of patients who are coming to our EDs with a psychiatric condition in the, um, in the other part of the group, that's four out of five in the 12 to 28 hour, and all of the patients coming to our ED in the less than 12 hour group, that um, turns out to be about 10,000 visits over that same 12 month period. You might recall that we modeled what the impact of having about 26 extra beds would have been um, on that group during the 12 month period had we had these beds around. And what we saw across the state was about a 55% reduction in the number of patient hours for these patients um, in the EDs. And finally, we turned our attention recently to looking at um, some of the assumptions that we used in our analysis and relaxing some of those. And here's one slide that we shared with our PIPS group where we talked about what if we could decrease the length of stay on average by one day for all of the patients in, our, in that unmet need group. And what we found is if we, on average, reduce that length of stay by about one day, we could decrease the need for, um, for these additional beds by about one and a half to, to two beds. So very helpful, um, but not, um, you know, not a big driver in that, that pretty large additional bed need number. 
Um, the other thing we did was we looked at, and by the way, this length of stay adjustment would be either for you know improved treatment modalities, um, but it also could be um, addressing some of the barrier um, days um, issues. You know, when we looked at barrier days at the medical center, what we found across that group of patients. Um, was that there were some barrier days, but that barrier days, again, weren't a huge driver um, in, um, in the additional bed need. What we found over for the medical center was over the period of a year, reducing the barrier days that we saw um, would have freed up two beds um, out of all the beds um, at the medical center. Could you just... Um, just define barrier days? Oh, sure. Um, the barrier days are the number of days between the, the time that a patient is ready for discharge um, until the time that they are actually discharged. You're welcome. Um, the other thing we looked at, and let's, we'll talk about for a minute, is the, those, those IMD beds that um, they're at risk of, of being lost. You can think of that those IMD beds as really being a one-for-one one either addition to the number of additional beds that we would need. So if we take away, if if, a, if we lose a bed that's today covered under the IMD waiver, it would add to the additional bed need. Um, so that's really a straight one-for-one one, um, net add. Oops. All set. Turn it over. Over to you, Eric. All right. Speaking of, of IMD, it's important to remember that the really great work that Eve and her team have done has been intended to identify the statewide need for additional inpatient beds. It hasn't been intended by itself to tell us how much of that need should be met through new beds on the CBMC campus. In order to do that, we need to start taking account of a whole host of other factors. But really high on that list of other factors is the sustainability, not just of any new inpatient unit, but the sustainability of CVMC as a community hospital. And in order to assure sustainability, we need to make sure that we don't do anything that would jeopardize CVMC's ability to draw on federal funds for the treatment of its Medicaid-eligible patient population. That, in turn, leads us back to a deeper dive into the Institution for Mental Disease, or IMD, exclusion. And so we'll take a few minutes to talk about that. Let me start with the rule. Federal funding under Medicaid isn't available for services provided to an adult inpatient at an institution for mental disease. Now, this so-called IMD exclusion has been baked into Medicaid since its inception in 1965, and in fact, predates Medicaid in some other prior funding statutes. And now, decades later, it's easy to lose track of why it's there. It served a purpose that was laudable and important then and remains laudable and important now, and that is it promotes parity and it disincentivizes institutionalization. And that remains as important today as it was in 1965. But it also does something now that it did then, which is it shifts the burden of the uh, paying for mental health care from the federal government to the states, and that's the conundrum that we're dealing with right now. Um, you look at the rule, and the first question you need to ask is, okay, what's an IMD? So we've put that up here. It's a hospital or a nursing home with more than 16 beds that's primarily engaged in the treatment of people with mental disease. Think Brattleboro Retreat classic IMD, think Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital in Vermont as the two biggest IMDs. Obviously, CVMC has more than 16 beds, and that's going to remain the case for the foreseeable future. So the thing that we need to focus on in determining the implications of this rule is, what does it mean to be primarily engaged in the diagnosis, treatment of care of folks with mental disease? 
And so it brought us up here to the test that is, in, that is included in the state Medicaid manual. What the state and ultimately CMS is going to ask is, is the overall character of a facility one that is of a mental hospital, as we would normally think of it? Um, and as only lawyers can, in order to discern whether something is, has the overall character of an IMD, they have a five-factor test. Before we go through this five-factor test, I want to make something really clear. I believe that whether we added 17 beds, 25 beds, 32 beds, the overall character of CVMC is very likely to remain one of an acute care community hospital that looks a lot different than the Brattleboro Retreat or Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. And if you look at the factors, you can see why. An IMD is typically licensed as a psychiatric facility, accredited as a psychiatric facility, and is very often under the jurisdiction of the state, like VPCH is. None of those things are true, at least as the regs define them, for CVMC. But we still need to focus on these last two factors because our regulators do, and because they uh, have become important in the, the decisional law that helps determine whether an institution is determined to be an IMD. And we focus most closely on this question, the last factor, of whether or not more than 50% of the patients in the facility are there for the treatment of mental illness. Now, in order to determine this, you don't look at the number of beds that are designated for physical health versus mental health. You don't even look at the average census of patients in the facility over a year, over a month, over a week. Instead, the state and CMS will look at the number of patients in the hospital on the day the determination is being made as to whether or not the facility is an IMD. And they look, your denominator is the total number of inpatients, your numerator is the total number of inpatients there for psychiatric care, and if you are above 50%, you are at risk of being determined to be an IMD when that factor is considered with all of the others that need to be taken into account when determining the overall character of the facility. Now, Eric, can I ask a quick yeah. question? Is that, uh, does that final factor come out of the case law or is that in the regs? That's in the regs. Final factor is in the regs, but I would say it's taken on outsized importance in some of the decisional law. That might be because some of the others are kind of easy. It's check right. the box. Are you licensed? Are you accredited? This uh, is a little bit uh, squishier a factor, and as a result, it's probably where the battle is joined and therefore where the, the decisional law gets produced, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense, because you could certainly see that if you're talking about a smaller community-based hospital whose census maybe varies quite a bit on the inpatient side over time, that what day you pick ends up being key. That's exactly right. In a minute, we'll turn to CVMC, and I'll give you some, you'll get a really graphic illustration of how that can play out at even a medium-sized uh, hospital. Before I do that, could you just give me a little more background on the day the determination is made? How often is it redetermined? The so frequency of that? there is nothing in the state Medicaid manual that says how often it needs to be determined. There's nothing in the state Medicaid manual that says that it has to be every year, every five years, or that really provides any additional significant guidance on, for instance, when the survey would take place, when the determination would be made. And as a practical matter, I think that this comes up so seldom, at least in Vermont, where most of our institutions are very clearly an IMD or an acute care hospital, that there hasn't been a robust process built around it here or in many other states. And so we don't have a lot of guidance on that, to be honest with you. Is there a reconsideration and an appeal process available? So there is not a reconsideration and appeal process built into the regulations. But in talking with folks who um, think about these things for a living and represent clients who have to navigate these, I do understand that very often, if in the unlikely event, in the unfortunate event, 
they hit you on a bad day where your med medical surgical census was low and your inpatient psych census was high. As with many things CMS related, there may well be a period during which you can take corrective action in, uh, in, in an attempt to cure the problem in a sustainable way going forward. But again, that's based on knowledge that is um, not codified anywhere, but is just uh, gleaned from folks who practice in this area around the country. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to include the last bullet point here because um, it's easy to lose track of this. The implications of being deemed an IMD are not simply that you lose federal Medicaid funding for the mental health care that you provide at the institution. The consequences are that you lose federal funding through Medicaid, sorry, for all of the care that you provide at the hospital. You can no longer draw down federal funds for Medicaid eligible cardiac patients, the hip fracture, the pneumonia, and you can see why as a result it is of existential importance that we get this right with respect to the number of beds at CBMC. So with all that background in mind, here's the question. How many psychiatric beds, when added to the 15 existing beds, would put CVMC at risk of being deemed an IMD? And as you can imagine, there are a whole bunch of factors that go into answering that question. The easy ones are taking a look at the historical census on the inpatient uh, med surge and psych side, and we'll look at that in a second. The more difficult ones involve projections. What is our medical surgical census likely to look like in the future? That's determined in part by some things that are beyond our control, national and local trends regarding how and where care is delivered. But it's also really important to keep in mind that it is based on some things that are within our control. This board has already heard a little bit about the UVM uh, Health Network's care delivery optimization process, through which we are trying to make sure that we deliver high quality care as close to patients' homes as possible. And so when we think what the numerator and more importantly the denominator of the IMD equation is going to be going forward, we are thinking hard about our efforts to keep care local, to keep care in our community hospitals like CVMC where that's appropriate. We're also, of course, going to look at projections regarding inpatient psychiatric occupancy in the future. And that depends on a whole bunch of factors, including how many beds are there in the system. If there are fewer beds in the system, our occupancy rate of whatever beds we build is going to be higher. If there are more, we might be able to keep it at a more manageable level. So we're trying to think about and model that as well. Then, of course, we're thinking about whether or not, if things got tight, we do have the flexibility to take inpatient psychiatric beds offline for certain periods of time in the unlikely and, and, and if uh, med surge censuses fell in an unpredictable way or in a way that wasn't forecast. And then, not finally, but last for our purposes, when you're thinking about the number of beds, this is distinct from IMD, you got to think about staffing efficiencies. We all know that staffing a new unit is going to be one of the major challenges we face and doing it efficiently is an even greater challenge. And what our facilities planners have told us is that with some exceptions, eight bed increments promote staffing efficiency and therefore help our ability to run this in a sustainable fashion going forward. So does, it, does the architecture play into that uh, staffing efficiency? Absolutely. And it, the architecture plays into it, the programming of the beds in terms of the acuity of the patients who are being treated plays into it. Um, but all of those factors tend to converge on eight bed increments, according to the folks uh, at HALSA that we're working with. So when you take all of this and more in mind and begin to apply it to CVMC, here is what you find. CVMC is licensed for 122 beds, but we know that what you're licensed for is not a terribly important part of the equation here. They are staffed for an average daily census of 57 patients plus or minus, and they flex up 
or they flex down as the census uh, requires. Really important to keep in mind that this is an average. Um, Anna Noonan and I were talking before we came in today, and for the last several weeks, their census has been in the high 70s and low 80s virtually every single day. Um, and so 57 is the long-term average, but over the last few weeks and months, we've seen it patients, uh, patient censuses much, much higher than that. You see how that breaks down. Of the 15 inpatient beds, we have an average census of 12 to 13. Now you need to remember that some of those are semi-private rooms, and so 12 to 13 is very often an effective 100% capacity in those 15 beds given the treatment milieu and the needs of the patients. And then a medical surgical census of 44 to 45. And if we were in a world where you could look at the averages, you'd look at this and say, 44 minus 12, you can build about 31, 32 new beds without risking flipping your, your over the 50% mark. But because of the, the factors that we just discussed, you can't do that. Instead, what you need to look at is how these censuses fluctuate. The bottom, the chart on the bottom, the blue lines are the medical surgical census at CVMC for a period from 2014 to 2018. The red lines are the inpatient psychiatry census during that same period. And what you see is that while they both fluctuate a little, the medical surgical census is much, much bouncier over time and the inpatient psych is a little bit smoother over time. And if I were to take this chart and kind of restate the challenge that's in front of us, it's this. How many more beds could we add without risking that the red line becomes taller than the blue line on nearly any given day over the course of the year? And so we put that question to three different groups within the, uh, the uh, three different experts within the group of folks who are helping us think about this problem. First, we had the folks from Hulse, our facilities planners, look at the question. They looked at historical data like this, and they overlaid different numbers of new beds, basically lengthened the red lines by, the, uh, by different increments, 15, 20, 25, 30, to see when the reds started getting taller than the blues. Then we asked Eve and her team, including Zach Sullivan, to do um, a miniature version of what we did for the needs analysis, which is build a computer simulation model that takes historical data and into which you can input different projections about the future, and it produces a table of probabilities that on any given day, at any number of new beds, you're likely to spike over the 50% mark. And then we asked uh, a group from Manette Health, which is the lawyers and policy experts that have been helping us navigate the IMD rules more generally, to do an analysis based not just on the probabilities, but on their experience with similar clients across the country. And after taking all three of those analyses into account, we, began, we um, became quite comfortable with the conclusion that at CVMC, we can add 25 new beds to the 15 existing beds and have an inpatient unit totaling 40 beds divisible by eight. That will not create an appreciable risk that CVMC will be deemed an IMD, will not meet the entire unmet need in the state as identified by Eve's analysis, which said we need 29 to 35 beds, but that we think will still make a very important difference in CVMC's, the UVM Health Networks, and the state of Vermont's ability to treat our mental health patients who are currently not getting the care in the right place and right time, and allow CVMC to meet its mission of serving both physical and mental health care needs of the central Vermont population. That's where we came down. That, that's what our, these analyses have shown, and I'm happy to answer any questions before turning it over to Bob to talk about program, programming considerations. Questions for Eric? I have a quick one. Um, with this number, with this 40, does that include you had a possibility of 
um, taking some beds offline as the next surge unit came down. Is this assumption that these would be online all the time? This is uh, the 25 new beds may depend on our, certainly depends on our ability to manage the med surge census and the inpatient psychiatry census. Whether or not it would require us to take beds offline depends in part on how successful we are in keeping the med surge census at the place we believe it needs to be. I think it's fair to say that if we build a 40 bed unit, there may be points in time and the system will need to learn to um, anticipate to this and we will need to learn how best to predict and react to this that we may need for short period of, periods of time to say there's an empty bed, but I'm sorry we're not able to take that, this patient at this time, but that the periods during which that is true are so um, small compared to the overall that this is a really, this is the right decision and right trade-off to make in order to serve the most number of people most of the time. Have there been conversations with anybody else to try to uh, deal with the uh, four to ten uh, on that needs that still would be out there? Not that I am aware of, Chairman Mullen. Um, I know that there are lots of folks working hard on this at the retreat, at other places around the state. We are in constant engagement with uh, colleagues who provide non-hospital based care to continue to try to maximize community and other services to either reduce lengths of stay or reduce the number of people who need inpatient care. Um, but I think we can anticipate that if we build something short of the number of beds to, uh, identified as the need, that our occupancy rates within the beds that do get built will continue to remain pretty high. Um, but will still be able to make an appreciable difference on the wait times and the lack of care currently. Absolutely, much needed. Good afternoon. We've reviewed the analysis that tells us how many beds we ideally would build to reduce wait times. And we've overlaid on that the IMD restrictions that will limit us a bit to 25 additional beds. And now the question becomes, if we have 40 beds, how do we program them? How do we configure them to do the best job possible for our design goals? So we, we don't have the answers to these questions yet, but we're entering the planning phase where we intend to answer, when we intend to answer these. And we have some design goals. Um, one of them obviously is that we want to reduce the wait time in the emergency department to no more than four hours for people who have had an assessment and have been determined to need inpatient care as the next level of care. Um, and that, that is a major driver of our planning, obviously. Um, we also want to build the beds and staff the beds in a way that maximizes our ability to manage any psychiatric or medical presentation that may come to the emergency department. So we, we want to have as broad a competence and capability as we possibly can. We have to do this in an efficient, cost-effective way um, so that it's uh, sustainable. And importantly, we have to do it in a way that minimizes the risk of harm to other patients and staff. And this, this is an unpleasant reality that um, um, you know, is, is hard to talk about, but at it, it, VPCH, it's a high rate of staff entry. This is a dangerous job in, at some times, and our design has to take into account ways to minimize um, that harm to, to anybody. <coughs> the uh, initial process has been to look at ways that we would divide people by clinical characteristics into the subunits that constitute workable units. These are units that are seldom larger than 16 beds and maybe uh, are going to be in eight bed increments and maybe smaller than eight beds. And just how would we divide? Is there a rational way to divide? Um, we, we looked at the, uh, the ways that this is done um, 
at other places and at our places, and we conclude that the way that most hospitals subdivide populations correlates with measures of behavioral control, aggression, violence, and, and risk to other patients and staff. So we want to design the units to ensure the safe management, and we want to maximize personal independence and freedom from restraint. So we do not want a configuration that relies on seclusion or physical restraint or chemical restraint. Uh, the design has to minimize that while ensuring safety. And we want to, if we have these behavioral categories, we want to decide how many beds are logically assigned to each behavioral category. How many people do we have in these categories? Uh, and that would drive the number of beds we would build in each one. When we looked at the, um, uh, the ways this is done nationally and regionally, we weren't able to improve on what has evolved over many decades in Vermont and elsewhere. Um, that basically stratifies people in a way that corresponds to the existing Shepherdson 3 unit, the Shepherdson 6 unit, and what is now the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. So Shepherdson 3 is a low security unit. Shepherdson 6 can manage a degree of behavioral discontrol and aggression. And VPCH is designed to manage any level of behavioral control and aggression. CVMC, just for reference, is a mix of of what is now at uh, Shepherdson 3 and 6. And I think if they had had the opportunity to configure architecturally, they would have divided in a rational way. But just because of the urgency of hospital demand, uh, they're accommodating what they can. We divided, uh, we, we relabeled these um, groups into a Tier 3, Tier 2, and Tier 1. Tier 3 corresponds to SHEP 3. Tier 2 to SHEP 6, Tier 1 to VPCH. Um, and I just, as a footnote, want to acknowledge the comments from one of our um, uh, community participants who pointed out that uh, Tier 1 can be a little confusing because we already have a nomenclature of Level 1 that many people are familiar with. And um, Level 1 is a, t is a term used by the Department of Mental Health for its contracted units for a, a determination that more resus, resources are needed for a particular patient. So there's a different um, reimbursement for that care. It's, it's a technical term that is a DMH term. We want to make it clear that we're trying to uh, describe people clinically and not as a legal mechanism. But for all practical purposes, if you're familiar with level one, tier one and level one are basically the same thing. So I, I just feel like I should explain that um, because it came, I got that feedback and I, I don't want to, the intention is not to confuse anyone, the intention is to clarify. Um, we did two independent literature reviews. We did not find other stratification models in the literature. And uh, we do know that in large urban areas with many uh, psychiatry beds and large populations, the units are configured in a specialized way. They, there may be geriatric units, mood disorder units, psychotic disorder units. Um, and we, uh, we don't think we have the luxury of creating that kind of subspecialized care because the next person who has a need for hospitalization may not fit where there is an empty bed in a specialized unit. So we are opting as a design goal um, to maximize our ability to care for any diagnosis any associated medical problem within reason uh, and to separate mainly by behavioral need. It happens that the behavioral um, characteristics of the patient correlate to the kinds of clinical program that we would use. So, um, and I'm going to just point out the different, the characteristics quickly of the different tiers. Um, Tier 1 corresponding to VPCH today, or level 1 if you know that term, um, are often psychotic disorders, mania, brain injury. They may have uh, associated substance use problems or medical problems. They have poor, commonly or as a tendency, have uh, poor behavior control. They can be threatening, they can be violent, they can be aggressive. They can have potential sexual aggression and uh, very limited personal boundaries. Um, the tier two 
is, uh, tends to be the same uh, diagnostic categories, but the behavioral discontrol is less, the physical danger is less, the, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a lighter version of tier one. And tier three uh, tend to be uh, people with depression, personality disorders, sometimes substance use disorders, anxiety disorders, associated commonly with, with high suicide risk, but uh, there is not usually a behavioral dysregulation. The patients are verbal. They're able to work together in a group. Um, they, they can engage in treatment and conventional uh, psychotherapeutic treatments and reflection. And um, they are uh, more easily able to associate together and work together in a therapeutic environment. Um, so the, uh, you might now say, well, why don't we just create the same level of security for all of these tiers and maximize the flexibility of the use of any beds? And one simple um, answer to that is that it's much more expensive to build a tier one bed than a tier three bed. And most of our patients are tier three, not tier one. So we're gonna have to struggle with the question of how to, if we build 40 beds, how many of them will be tier three? How many of them will be tier two? And how many will be tier one? And we, we plan to, that will be part of the process in the uh, phase two planning. And we will engage others uh, in that conversation. We'll engage stakeholders broadly to, uh, to look at that question. We also are eager in the tier one and tier two to have mechanisms to separate aggressive patients. So uh, it's not necessarily necessary to create small units if there's a way to simply separate people who are in conflict and may, um, may be aggressive with each other. Uh, we don't have a way of actually measuring the number of people who are presenting with each tier, but there are some correlational characteristics that Zach Sullivan and Eve's group have used with us, um, and we'll vet those data and uh, use that to assign the, the number of beds to each tier. In this phase two, uh, we will begin a programming, a facilities programming process, which also will lead and involves identifying every space needed, the size of the space, the contiguity of the space, uh, how spaces are associated in principle, and that table of spaces and sizes will be used by the architect later to actually configure a potential floor plan or space. And we will have to integrate with the CVMC master facility plan to make sure that any planning that is done for the new psychiatry and patient services doesn't unduly uh, compromise future planning for other services at CVMC. We'll begin looking at the financial impact, including the capital needs, and in the process of designing the uh, the, the programming for various units will have, will be able to identify a staffing plan and the, the financial cost of uh, the actual operating cost. I believe that's the end of my part, and I'm happy to answer questions if I can. Sure, I'll, I'll start with uh, the most basic of questions. Where's the timeline? <laughs> so we are committed to the original timeline of uh, three to four years for the full process. Uh, we are still honestly articulating the key milestones. Um, some phases have taken a little longer than we anticipated. As an example, the data analytics phase took a little longer than we anticipated. We hope by the time we come to you for our next quarterly update that we'll be very succinct with that timeline for you. Okay. Now, having worked on projects, it's usually you might have things that take a little longer in one phase that you might be able to expedite another phase. So it would just be helpful to have some type of timeline so that we can actually try to anticipate what we mm -hmm. might actually see in the finished product. Understood. Questions from the board? Tom? Just, just to follow up to Kevin's, um, so when you present this timeline that next time we meet, can you also have that kind of showing in, in integration with the master facility plan so that we can get some sense as to whether uh, 
they're uh, trotting along at the same pace? Yes, that's the intent. So we're trying to sync up our overall master facilities plan with this initiative, and that we can't do one without the other, and that we have to understand um, the most opportune location for um, this particular facility or unit. Um, so that's the intent, is to bring those two pieces together. Absolutely. Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, every presentation is a one step closer to trying to help this problem that we have in the state, so I appreciate that. Um, my question actually is tying together the IMD and the programming. I'm just wondering, as you were talking with Dr. Kirchner about some of the programming, I'm wondering, given the IMD concerns, um, would you be thinking about the, the placement of patients with long lengths of stay right, in CVMC, that's going to reduce some of your flexibility to take patients offline. So I'm just wondering, does that affect tier one, tier two, tier three bed placements in CVMC if you have, for example, more tier one, more geriatric patients that are harder to discharge, reduce some of your flexibility to balance the bed surge and the cycle of bed. So just wondering if that's part of the capital step. It, it will have to be. the um, the. In parallel to creating the new beds, we also have to address the patient flow issues. And, and there are some opportunities there. You know, um, first of all, we have to do that anyway um, because it's inefficient to keep people in a hospital who can be cared for in a less expensive and less intensive environment. Um, the, um, just coming back to a question that Eric actually answered, and I, I thought um, I would add, uh, if we do replace the Middlesex Secure Residential Facility, um, that will have a significant impact on, the, uh, on our bed need. Because we have calculated the number of beds needed based on the status quo, and the status quo is that there are people at VPCH who are waiting in an acute care setting that is really designed for assessment stabilization and other hospital functions who really could transition to a different place with a less intensive, uh, at least less intensive medical component. So I, I see that as a ray of hope in the, um, in the dilemma of trying to juggle the incoming need and the outgoing need. But I think the bottom line is that we're gonna have to keep paramount a flexibility because we don't know what the future brings and we're going to have to adapt to whatever happens today, whatever happens in real time as patients are seeking hospitalization. Thank you. Okay, I guess we'll open it up to uh, the public for questions or comments. Ken. Yes, I think uh, as, as a person who's participating in some of the meetings, I really have to say that um, <clears throat> this is a really strong team uh, are working hard to figure out pieces of the puzzle. <clears throat> and you know, it's, it, it, uh, one of the realities is when you have a good team, you actually should expect more, not less. <laughs> and it's a weak team. You kind of, ah, oh, well, whatever. Uh, if, you know, if you added uh, Dr. Brumstead to the group, it would be like a five-person basketball team. And they kind of have everything. They have, you know, clinical expertise. They have legal expertise. They have very good administrative and communication skills. And they're really being very thoughtful. Which one will throw the elbows? Uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> I said they're good, but they're not perfect. Um, the, the, the issue that I would raise is, and I think uh, the chair uh, picked up on this right away, as so others did. You know, it's, there's a balance between being incredibly thoughtful and thorough and somehow not building in the reality that there's a crisis here and there's a sense of urgency. You know, there are seven members of the sitting in front here and representing different communities. And in your communities over the next year, you have people going to your local emergency rooms and potentially getting stuck there. Um, if it was pneumonia, as somebody mentioned, or it was heart disease or cancer, the notion that you have folks sitting in the emergency room for days represents a true crisis. And um, I think the one thing that this team doesn't have 
yet, maybe, is speed, um, which is very important for a team to have. And so I turn to the board and say, um, perhaps some thought could be given as almost the one year mark in this project is gonna be reached to figuring out how it builds speed in the timetable. It's just not acceptable in some ways to say, well, it's gonna be four years because when you say it's gonna be four years, it's gonna be five years. It's a little bit like in the legislative session, which many of you are familiar with. Everything should get done uh, in a timely fashion, but it's the last week of the session where 75% of work and decisions get made. So I hope that you really do put a focus on this question of timetable. Um, this, is not, this is not simply uh, a project which is very important and a lot of good work's getting done, but there's a real crisis out there, which is frankly, as people I think on the board have said, it's a disgrace and to some degree, you are the managers of this project and you either can build incentives into having speed in the project or disincentives. And I just uh, would ask you as the um, year ends, year one, to figure out how to build in urgency and incentives and speed to move this project along even faster than it is because there's a real crisis out in the communities. And it will only get worse, in my opinion, not better between the time of now and whenever the door is open on the new facility. Thank you for those comments, uh, Ken. And, uh, I think everybody in the state wishes it could magically happen overnight. We know that can't happen. I think that people are trying to do the best they can. We, we encourage, I wouldn't say speed, because we don't want any errors in speed, but we encourage that it be accomplished as soon as possible with the best possible results. So, and I'm pretty sure that everybody that I'm looking at understands that. Dr. Brumstead. I guess I'm speaking from the public uh, perspective because I'm not up there. And I actually agree 110% um, uh, with Mr. Liebertoff. Um, the obvious counterbalance is the Vermont way and the Vermont culture, which is to make sure that we engage people appropriately to kick the tires on this plan. I can guarantee you, uh, even without a fifth member, this team could go off and in a very short period of time design what would be a really credible solution and get shovel in the ground, what we would lack in that is the kind of discourse and uh, back and forth and uh, frankly uh, important input into what this looks like. Um, so we've got to balance those two things, Ken, but we're not going to take our foot off the gas pedal. Uh, we're going to try and do that balancing act but end up solving this crisis as quickly as we can. Thank you, Dr. Barmstead. Other, uh, yes, in the back. Uh, so, uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, in the planning process, and I think John alluded to it, um, there has been and have been considerable conversations with community partners in reaching some of the <coughs> conclusions that they're reaching. And um, while, um, I think Eric was alluding to the implications for the bed count based on IMD and whether we continue to get a IMD waiver and if there are other beds that drop off. I think it's important to recognize that all of this calculus is predicated on having a strong community-based system that to the greatest extent possible diverts individuals from coming into the bed in the first, in a patient bed in the first instance, and then having the capacity to take people out as quickly as possible. So I, that's that's one point I want to make, and I and I think that there's a been a clear acknowledgement on the part of the health network that um, this activity cannot exist in a vacuum, and I expect that that in fact is part of the active planning process that has taken place and will take place. Secondly, and I guess um, recognizing the, that 
the network is in fact responding to the charge from the Green Mountain Care uh, Board. Um, I want to acknowledge that they're basically answering the question that you asked, but without um, meaning to be disrespectful, you've only asked half the question because all of the patients that they are talking about are adults. And the reality is that we have a significant problem with children who require psychiatric care. And these beds are not um, being talked about for children. So just as an example on Monday, because that's the last date I have data for, because we track, um, and I work at the Howard Center in Chittenden County, so we work um, with folks who are um, involved in the activities that we've been discussing. So on Monday, we had 17 patients waiting for an inpatient placement. Five of those were adults in the ER, and two of those were adult uh, children in the ER. But we had 10 children waiting in the community because when children show up in the emergency room in crisis, they're typically coming with a family member, and the family member is acknowledging that they have reached their limit in terms of knowing how to deal with this psychiatric crisis. But they're not kept there. They're sent back home to wait until a placement can, can be found. And I'm not blaming the hospital for that. I'm just acknowledging that there is a tapped out resource, i.e. families, which are being asked to carry the burden of caring for their psychiatrically challenged children that they've already acknowledged they don't have the capacity to do because we have an inadequate amount of psychiatric inpatient beds for children. And so I would ask the Green Mountain Care Board to keep that in your frame of mind as you're thinking about the conversations in your regulatory role going forward. Thank you, it's an excellent point. It reminds me of all the discussions that we had when I was on the Education Committee about uh, students who, uh, a lot of frustrated school officials who didn't think that kids were getting the correct treatment fast enough. And so I'm sure this is not just a Burlington problem, it's a statewide problem, one that's going to have to be addressed. So, any other questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, I, I want to thank the team, and uh, I would bet on this basketball team any day. <laughs> thank you. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.